This is Retro Sports Radio. Visit RetroSeasons.com for more sports history. The Kansas City Royals traveled to California to face the Angels at Anaheim Stadium for a Wednesday night game on September 17, 1986. The Royals were the defending world champions, having defeated the Cardinals in 1985. They were now managed by Mike Ferraro, who had taken over from Dick Hauser midway through the season. The team was struggling in 1985, entering this game 16 games out in the American League West that was led by the high-flying California Angels. California was 23 games over 500 and had a solid nine-game lead down the stretch under manager Gene Mock. This audio recording is from the Angels radio broadcast, featuring announcers Al Conan and Ron Fairley. All right, Ron, thank you very much. And we go to the ball game with the Angels trying to reduce that magic number to nine. Nineteen games left to play, including tonight. And this evening, it's Don Sutton going against the Kansas City Royals. Leading it off, Willie Wilson, who had such a marvelous game last night. He went three for five. And Lonnie Smith on deck had four hits. But the Angels pulled it out nonetheless. Sutton to the windup, and the first pitch of the game is swung on and pulled toward first. Right there at the bag is Rich, and he steps on the bag for the out. So Wilson, first ball swinging, as he did last night, but this time he grounds out. And the center fielder back to the dugout with his average down a tick from the 271 mark with which he began the game. So that'll bring up Lonnie Smith, who with his four hits last night, lifted his average to 293, and he is hot right now. He's hit an 11 straight, during which he's hit 511. Sutton, with that slow windup, delivers, and his fastball is inside, 1-0. So Smith... About as hot as he's been all year long. In fact, his average of 293 at a seasonal high. Sutton right back to him, and there's a line drive at well to center field. Pettis going back on the ball, still going back. On the track, he makes it over the shoulder catch. So Lonnie Smith hits it well, but not well enough. Two down in the opening inning, and Rudy Law will be stepping in. The former Dodger, former Chicago White Sox. Now laboring with the Royals, hitting 257. The Angels with Bobby Gritch at first base again tonight. Molly Joyner improving with that shoulder, but not yet ready to start. Gus Polidor at second. Dick Schofield, the shortstop, and Doug DeSensei at third. Sutton cranks it up, and the first one to Rudy Law. is swung on and driven to right center field. George Hendrick on his horse. He's there and makes the catch, and it's an easy one, two, three inning for Don Sutton. No runs, no hits, no errors. Nobody left on base, and after a half an inning here at the stadium, it's the Royals nothing and the Angels coming up. Okay, and again, Don Sutton uh, for the Angels, pitching for the Angels. Danny Jackson for the Royals. Jackson's 10 and 10. Sutton, a nice record this season, 14 and 9. Another game starting up just about the same time as ours. The White Sox at Seattle. Floyd Bannister pitching for Chicago. He's 9 and 11. Mark Langston, 12 and 11 for Seattle. And a game that started uh, just a little while ago, and they're still scoreless in the uh, bottom of the second, is the San Francisco at San Diego game. That started up about a half an hour ago. Guy to Blue is 9-10, and 10, pitching for the Giants. Ed Vosberg, who has uh, no record at all this season, 0-0 o o on the mound for the Padres. We might mention that uh, California has some uh, 18 games left to play, including this one. Actually, uh, the Angels have played only 143, so it would be 19. However, uh, there's one game that they won't play unless it's necessary, and that is a game at Cleveland. So for all practical purposes, 18 games left in the season for the Angels. Eleven of them at home, including uh, tonight's action with Kansas City. Uh, another one with KC on Thursday. Then there are three with Chicago on the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st. Three with Cleveland at home, uh, the 22nd, the 23rd, the 24th. Then the Angels have three with Texas on the 26th, 27th, and 28th. Then a little bit of a road trip for seven games. They go to Kansas City for three games on the 29th uh, and the 30th and October 1st. And then uh, finally, winding up the season, four games at Texas, where the Angels are playing Texas, the Rangers, on October 2nd, October 3rd, October 4th, and October 5th. And should the division race really narrow up, and of course uh, it may, may very well, especially with those uh, four games at Texas, and should the Angels falter in the meanwhile and Texas uh, do some good work, they will complete that uh, one game at Cleveland. Of the first inning, no score as we begin, and Gary Pettis takes the first pitch from Danny Jackson and grounds it to second base. Frank White right there to field and throws him out. So just like that, one away. So Jackson ready in a hurry and gets Pettis quite quickly, and Dick Schofield will come up now, hitting 251. 
Danny Jackson, 10 and 10 on the year, an ERA of 3.49, trying to become only the second Kansas City starter with a winning record this year. The other, Mark Gubazow, is 10 and 6. And it's really not the way it figured when the season began. They had Brett Saberhagen, the Cy Young Award winner, Charlie Lebran, a big winner last year, too. There's a fastball to Schofield for Cy on one. But the starting rotation this year has been inconsistent, to say the least, for the Royals. The strike one to Schofield is just inside. One ball, one strike. Danny Jackson, though, has had his good moments. Though he is 0-1 against the Angels, his defeat was a memorable one because he threw a five-hitter at the Angels, which was his best performance of the year. The 1-1 pitch is a chopper toward first. Seitzer is there. He waves off Jackson and beats Schofield to the bag. So quickly, two up and two down. And that'll bring up Downing, who was one of the key architects of last night's victory. He had a base hit in that seventh inning to help the Angels come from behind. And he has been doing it all year long to the Royals. He's the Angels' leading hitter against Kansas City, hitting 367. So two out, nobody on. Bottom of the first, no score. Danny Jackson waiting for Downing. And Brian settles in. The left-hander staring down at his catcher, Jim Sundberg. Now he cranks it up. And the first pitch to Brian is on the inside corner, called a strike. It's Kevin Seitzer at first base tonight. Frank White at second. Buddy Bianca on the shortstop. Jamie Quirk at third. Strike one is popped up. Foul ground, first base side. Sights are coming down and over, and he makes the catch. And the side retires. So like Don Sutton, Danny Jackson disposes of the first three batters he faces and does it in a hurry. No runs, no hits, no errors. Nobody left, and we'll go to the second. Angels nothing, Royals nothing. Now, the Angels are on a little bit of a roll, a mini roll, if you will. They have won two and a row, uh, seven out of their last ten. And the last one at the hands uh, they have uh, at the expense, that is, of the Royals as they uh, start this three-game series that started it on Tuesday, and this is the second of the three that we're in tonight. Bob Boone's two-out single driving in pinch runner Devin White in the eighth inning on Tuesday, and that gave the Angels a 6-5 to five victory, just eking that one out over Kansas City. The victory reducing, uh, as you heard, the Angels' magic number to 10 for clinching their first American League West title since 1982. Now, despite Texas' 10-6 to six triumph over Oakland, California maintained its nine-game lead over the second-place Rangers going into Wednesday action. Now, Texas has, of course, won again, so that now is the gap to eight and a half. In this game uh, on Tuesday, Kansas City had tied the score in the eighth on Bo Jackson's two-run homer. Loser in the game was Dan Quisenberry. He's two and seven on the year. He retired the first two batters in the eighth before pinch hitter Wally Joyner beat out an infield single just out of Quisenberry's reach. White ran for Joyner, stole second, before Boone lined an RBI single to right, right fielder Jackson's throw to the plate was wide. Gary Lucas was the winner in this one. He's 4-0 and on the season. Pitched a scoreless ninth inning. He was awarded the victory for that effort. Donnie Moore, who had yielded Jackson's homer on his first pitch, was the pitcher of record during the California rally, but uh, he was deemed by the officials un, uh, ineffective, so Gary Lucas got that victory, and of course, that is their privilege. Well, that first inning went by in a hurry, Ron. Have you seen an inning this year that went faster than that? We didn't even get a chance to spot the defenses in there. No, I tell you what, uh, you have a bunch of guys down there in that batter's box this evening that are going after that first pitch. And that also tells you one other thing, that both sides know that that guy that's on the mound is going to throw strikes, and so you might as well go up there and go hacking. For Sutton, through the course of the year, has been working under basically a 100-pitch limit. And the Royals going up there swinging in a hurry, they actually play into his hands because that means he gets the job done on fewer pitches. So here's Jamie Quirk to lead things off of the Royals. No score in the second. Sutton delivers, and the first pitch is swung on and fouled away. Quirk is in there for George Brett. Brett started last night for the first time since August 29th battling a sore shoulder, and obviously it's still a problem because he's not in there this evening. Quirk with a 218 average, five homers, 20 runs batted in, but that's a bit deceiving because lately he's been swinging very well. Sutton right back to him, and the strike one is fisted foul for <laughs> base way, and it bounces in front of the angel dugout and back into the seat. Boy, he didn't get much of a hack at that one. I tell you what, that was a weak pop-up. <laughs> Unless you've hit a few of them. Well, he still didn't come close to my record yet. What's your record? I hit one back to the pitcher one night. Well, I'll tell you about that in a second. Here's a strike two from Sutton, and it's just outside, one or two. Yeah, they have that egg tossing contest. Yeah. How soft you can toss the egg back and forth. So it doesn't break. That's probably as hard as I hit it back to the pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> it just barely had enough on it to carry to the mound. 
Next one, the clerk is outside, two and two. And you had the full cut, right? I had a full cut. <laughs> I came back to the dugout, and Drysdale sat down next to me, and he says, Ron, that might be the puniest hit I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Two, the count to Jamie Quirk. Sutton delivers and it's dribbled slowly up the first base line. Sutton's down to get it. He quickly flips it to Grit covering in time. That was a tough play because as the ball went up the line, Sutton came down to get it. Grit started to go for it. And then when he realized Don was going to make the play, he had to retreat to get into position to take the throw. But the play goes in the book 3-1 to one, and that'll bring up Frank White who's hitting 266. the first one to White, and it's a curveball low, 1-0. We started to spot that angel defense for you in the first inning. Did not do it completely, and we'd like to do that now. Here's the 1-0 from Sutton, and White hits a high pop fly over short, shallow left, Schofield backpedaling, and he'll make the catch on the ground. So two down, and Kevin Seitz are coming up. We mentioned in the infield, it's Bobby Bridget first, Polidor second, Schofield is short, stop into Tente third. In the outfield, it's Brian Downing in left, Gary Pettis in center, and George Hendrick in right. Bob Boone catching, and it's Don Sutton on the mound. The winner of four consecutive decisions, although he did not figure in his last start at Chicago. And he is perhaps pitching his best baseball of the year right now. His ERA certainly at its low point of the season at 3.77. And he's given up just one earned run in his last 23 and a third innings of work. Boy, he's been doing well. His first one to Seitzer is a curveball that's just high, 1 0. We saw Seitzer for the first time last night. He went 0 for 4, but he displayed an outstanding swing. Certainly, it impressed some of the Angels. In particular, Moose Dubin, the Angel hitting instructor. The 1 0 pitch is a breaking ball in there for a strike, 1 1. Moose was saying that he looks to be very fundamentally sound and figures he's going to be a good hitter. And that he has been wherever he has played in the organization for the Royals. There's one fouled back off of first out of play, one and two. In fact, he has not had a pro season where he's hit less than 297. He hit 318 this year at Omaha. Kevin Seitzer filling in for Steve Balboni, who's on the sidelines again tonight with that sore back. And the Angels glad to hear that because Balboni has worn them out down through the last two years. No score in the second. Two out bases empty. The one two to Seitzer is a line drive at short and Schofield reaches up and pulls it down. So Seitzer hits the ball hard but has nothing to show for it as Don Sutton mows down the Royals in a hurry again in the second. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. And after one and a half at the big A, Angels nothing and the Royals nothing. Now, if you're following the National West race at all, you know that uh, Houston defeated Cincinnati on Tuesday night, and Houston has done it once again, and uh, they're just about putting the Reds out of reach here. Uh, Houston now has won 83, lost 62, and uh, the Reds are 74 and 71. They fall nine games behind the Astros, and that makes the magic number now for the Astros. Uh, it was 11. It is now nine, having defeated Cincinnati. And uh, here's the way uh, the uh, schedule looks. For the Astros, of course, they play Cincinnati once again at Cincinnati. Then they return home to the Astrodome, and uh, they have three with San Diego on the 19th, 20th, and 21st. They'll be hosting Los Angeles for two games on the 22nd and 23rd. The Astros will then host the Giants for two games on the 24th and 25th, and then three games uh, with Atlanta at the Astrodome on October 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Meanwhile, uh, between uh, those Atlanta and Giants games, they'll be going away again to Atlanta on September 26th, 27th, and 28th as the Braves host them. And uh, the Astros also go to the Giants uh, at the end of the month and the beginning of next month, September 30th, October 1st, and October 2nd for three games. And uh, if Cincinnati doesn't rally here, you can uh, pretty well kiss the National West goodbye as far as the Reds are concerned because Houston is uh, very rapidly now gaining a lock on that particular division. One and a half innings already in the books here at the Big A. A scoreless tie as the Angels come up for the second time against Danny Jackson. Doug Desensei, George Hendrick, and Bobby Gritch doing the honors as the Angels try to continue their outstanding play of late. They have been winning with regularity. They've taken five of the last seven. The pitch to Desensei is swung on and fouled off on one. 
Doug is the Security Pacific KMPC designated hitter for this ball game, so do keep track of his at-bats and then listen to the Jim Lang Show on KMPC tomorrow between 6 and 10 a.m., and you may get a chance from Gentleman Jim to win a $100 savings account from Security Pacific. The fifth egg rounds one toward third, quirk up to get the ball, guns across the sights are in plenty of time, and the synth is gone. So Doug, who started at a bat hitting 260 with 23 homers and 89 runs batted in, will have to wait until his next at bat to improve on that. Hitting 275. The first one from Jackson is in there for a strike on one. George also with 13 homers, 44 runs batted in. And really, the second half of the year, he's been making excellent contact. He swings and hits a high fly ball over third down the left field line, pretty shallow. Coming in is Rudy Law, and in fair ground, he makes a one hand grab. So Hendrick is retired. Two down in the bottom of the second, and both pitchers mowing down the opposition. Sutton getting the first six he has faced. Jackson the first five. And that'll bring up Bobby Gritch, who's hitting 288. The Angels certainly doing what you'd expect a championship team to do at this time of the year, and that's win, and win regularly. They've taken 16 of the last 20 games, 26 of the last 36. Hard to do better than that. There's a fastball that misses for ball one, one and oh. And you know they're only 10 wins away from tying a club record. The 1-0 pitch. It's a line drive foul down the right field line. 1-1 one one to Bobby. Back in 82, a Gene Moth-led team established the organizational record for wins in a single season, 93. And, of course, they won the division in the process. With 19 games remaining, including this one, they've got a good shot of setting a new standard. The 1-1 to Gritch. is a ground ball back to the middle into center field. There's the first base hit of the night. So Bobby is able to single back to the middle, and that'll bring up Rick Burleson, who's at 288 as well. You know, Ron, Danny Jackson, though his record is 10 and 10, can be a very impressive pitcher. He has a good fastball, one of the better sliders in the American League. And I remember reading some comments made by a lot of the St. Louis players after the World Series last year, and it was Danny Jackson who most impressed them. There's a ground ball to third, Quirk Bobble, picks it up, throws the first in time. And we'll get Ron's reaction on Jackson a bit later on because the second inning is over as Jackson is able to get the Angels quickly here in the second inning. No runs, one hit, no errors. One man left the board. We'll go to the third. Angels nothing, Royals nothing. And let's check some of the action already completed. Also in the American League, Boston, as we mentioned, having beaten the Brewers 4-1. to one. Dennis Oil can void the victor. Scattered eight hits. And Don Baylor and Dwight Evans hitting back-to-back -back home runs in the sixth inning, and that gave uh, the Red Sox not only the win over Milwaukee, but their 11th straight home victory. Four to one over the Brewers. Boston entering the contest with a nine-game lead in the American East, and uh, this victory now cuts the magic number for clinching the division title to eight, and that, of course, pending the outcome of games involving Toronto and New York, and as we mentioned earlier, both Toronto and New York are in the process of losing right now, unless they... Uh, managed to rally. Any combination of Red Sox victories and losses by a competitor, of course, will give Boston its first division title in 11 years, since 1975. Oil Canboyd is now 15-9 and nine on the air. He struck out six batters, walked one, records his ninth complete game of the season. Boston had taken a 2 to nothing lead in the second inning on just one hit. Baylor drew a leadoff walk. Evans doubled high off the left field wall. That scored Baylor. Then a wild pitch by Mark Newton put Evans on third, and he scored on Tony Armas' infield out. Mark Knudsen now takes the loss. He is 0-1 on the year. In the sixth, Baylor belted his 30th home run of the season over the left field wall. Evans followed by slugging number 24 for him, high off the light tower, just behind the left field wall at Fenway Park. We played two innings here at Anaheim Stadium, and boy, we've motored along. No score so far, as both pitchers have been on their game to this point. Bo Jackson leads it off for the Royals against Don Sutton, leading it off for us, Ron Fairley. Ron, it's all you. Thank you very much, Alan. Hello, everybody. Don Sutton facing Bo Jackson, who had a good night last night, and the first pitch of the inning. Here's a curveball hit sharply on two hops to Schofield. He knocks it down and goes to first base in time. Bo Jackson does not have a good start on the bounders box. But after
after he gets it going, look out. I don't think there's anybody in the league that can run with it. And I mean that. Now, Willie Wilson is on this staff, or on this ball club, and he runs extremely well as Sunberg comes to the plate. But I'm not too sure at a 100-yard dash that Bo Jackson cannot run it. I'll tell you one thing. He makes a routine round ball close an adventure. That's right. You but make a mistake with him running, and he's going to beat it. Here's Sundberg in the first pitches outside for ball one. Sutton has set down seven straight. You know, Ron, yesterday he hit the home run, and that got most of the attention in the past, but some of the Angels were really more impressed by something else he did. There's a curveball over the plate, but low for ball two. What was that? You remember when he grounded to short time? I think it was the sixth inning against Vern Rule. He hit a rocket yep. to, to Scofield. Something like one hop. He almost beat that play. He was, it was a close play. Here's a 2-0 pitch. Swung on and missed for a strike two and one. And that was what they were talking about today before the ball game. That was that impressed him more than the home run. Well, you have to admire anyone that takes the physical ability out on the field and does something over and above what anybody else can do. Here's the 2-1 pitch. And his line towards center field, Pettis on his horse, and he's there, and he almost overruns it. A line drive into right center field, and Gary Pettis, with that speed of his own, put on a burst of speed and almost misjudged that and almost overran it. So there's out number two in the inning, and Sutton has retired the first eighth that he's faced. Let's pause for station identification. You're listening to the Angels Radio Network. This game is moving along like a 100-yard dash. Major League Baseball coming your way on the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. We hope you're enjoying the game wherever in the world you happen to be listening. The first pitch to Buddy Biancolano is swung on and fouled back out of play. But just to continue, I thought just a little bit, and it doesn't make any difference whether it's on the basketball court, the football field, when you see someone that has that extra burst of speed, boy, they just kind of pop your eye, don't they? Well, that's the way that Jackson is. Here's the 0-1 pitch, and Biancolano swings and misses way out in front of the changeup, and it's quickly strike two. Both teams this evening all swinging at the first pitch. Bianca Lana did it. Bo Jackson did it. Here's the strike two pitch. And it's swung out and fouled right at the home plate area. The count remains 0-2. Well, if a, pitch, if a team wants to do that to Don Sutton, they're going to have problems because he has a tendency to sense that and not throw you anything good to hit. You don't have to throw a strike first pitch. Of course, you know, I will say this about Bo Jackson. He is starting his career playing baseball different than probably anybody else with the exception of a guy like a Mickey Mantle. But different than anybody else. Here's the strike two pitch. Tried to turn it over and ran the ball outside for a ball one and two. Well, how many rookies have an entire nation looking at them before they've played even two or three games? Well, even aside from the, from the media aspect of things. Here's the one-two pitch. A curveball low, and that's two and two now. Different in the sense is that how many guys start their career that have that kind of physical strength and power to go along with the speed and the running ability and the strong throwing arm? 2-2 two -two pitch. He has popped up at the home plate area. Boone out near, and now DeSense coming in and running Boone off of it right in front of home plate, and that'll do it for Bianca Lana and Kansas City. We'll talk more about that when we come back. Another 1-2-3 inning. Sutton has retired the first nine that he's faced, and after two and a half innings of play here at the Big A, still no score. Let's change the subject briefly in case you missed the uh, UPI poll that came out uh, earlier this week. The top 20 in football. We'll uh, recap them for you briefly. And uh, there have been some changes, of course. Uh, notably, Tennessee, OSU, and UCLA falling right off the top 20, with Tennessee really taking a drop from number 8 all the way down to below the top 20, having lost to Mississippi State 27-23. to OSU was number 12 last week. Ohio State lost to Washington 40-7, to some kind of loss there and also fell off the top 20. UCLA was right at the uh, bottom of the 20, number 19, last week, and uh, was idle, but uh, still managed to be edged off the 20. So here's the way it looks right now. Number one is Oklahoma, number two, Miami, number three, Michigan, number four, Alabama, number five, Nebraska. Then it's Penn State, Washington, LSU, Baylor, and Georgia. Number 11 is Auburn, number 12, Arkansas, BYU, number 13, Iowa, number 14. Arizona made the number 15 spot. Maryland is number 16, and then uh, Arizona State, unrated last week, unranked, that is, now number 17 on the UPI College Football Poll. Florida State, also not on the top 20 last week, has made it to number 18. Texas A&M, which was number 7 last week, but uh, because of its uh, loss uh, to LSU, falls to number 19, and number 20 on the UPI College Football Poll is Southern Cal. 
Gus Pelador lead things off to the Angels in their half of the third inning. He'll be followed by Boone. And then back to the top of the order in Gary Pettis. No score, bottom of the third inning. Just one hit so far. That'll be hit by Bobby Gritch in the second inning. Polidor looks at one low and outside, ball one. Gus last night went two for three. He's batting 360. Here's the next pitch, and it's a ground ball hit off the hands towards second base on two hops. White has it, and the short toss to Seitzer at first base, and Polidor is gone. Four three in the put out. That makes one away, and that brings up the hero in last night's game, Bob Boone. Bob Boone batting 223, seven home runs, and 46 runs driven in. And the first pitch to him is low and inside for ball one. Also, we were talking in last night's game about the fact of Schofield, Pettis, and Boone as the next pitch goes in and uh, low it inside, 2-0. And, and in spring training, you knew that that primarily would make up the bottom third of the Angels lineup. And when you take a look at tonight's play, Pettis has 50 runs driven in. Here's the 2-0 pitch, and Boone fouls it back. Jack Schofield has 54 runs driven in, and then Bob Boone has 100, or make that, uh, has 46. That makes a total of 150. Would you take that in spring training to get 150 RBIs out of your bottom third of the lineup? Absolutely. Here's a 2-1 pitch on the way, and it's high and outside, 3-1. And, and there's still more games to play, but the point well taken is that the big difference in the ball club this year, Downing and Defense and the guys in the middle part of the lineup have had good years. There's one that's over for a strike, and it's a full count, 3-2. and two. But that production in the bottom third of the lineup has really been a major factor why the Angels are where they are today. Boone stepping out. It is three balls and two strikes to Bob. They play him straight away. Jackson's pitch is on the way, and Boone hits it right off the hands, right back to the pitcher who knocks it down, and Jackson goes to first base, almost threw it away. And so Boone has got one three and a put out. And we go back to the top of the order in Gary Pettis. For Danny Jackson, he is really almost matching what Sutton has done. He has retired eight of nine that he has faced. And Sutton has retired the first nine. Pettis bounced out to second. He's only time up. Bunch went along the third base side. In comes the third baseman and the pitcher. And neither one of them can make the play. Bianca Lotta, not Bianca Lotta, but Jackson trying to get a handle on the ball and took his eye off of it. And Gary Pettis has an infield button for a base hit. two-out single. That brings up the shortstop, Dick Schofield, who bounced out to first base his only time up. Keep an eye on Gary Pettis. He has 40 stolen bases and has stolen 18 of the last 20. Jackson comes set, and the pitch to the plate is a looper into left field. That will fall for a base hit. Pettis holding at second base as Rudy Long gets the ball back to the infield. And the Angels have runners at first and second. Well, last night, Angels started to put things together after two men were out. And of course, they had the benefit of a couple of two or three base on balls. And then they dropped a couple of hits in there. But all that action took, a took place after two men were away. And here this evening, Polidor bounces out, Boone bounces out, Gary Pettis and Schofield have now singled. And so the Angels were the first threat of the game. And Downing is waiting, and the pitch is over for a call strike one right around the knees. Downing, working on a mini three-game hitting streak, has had a good month of September so far, batting right around 400. The 0-1 pitch is swung on and missed. Downing chasing a high fastball. And now Bryant is behind on the count 0-2. Also here in the month of September, Downing has hit three home runs and driven in 11. He has 82 in the year. Of course, Joyner leads the ball club, followed by DeCente, who is 89. The strike two pitch is a call strike three in the inside corner, and Downing cannot pull the trigger. And so Schofield and Pettis are left on base, and for the Angels, they have two hits in the inning. They have stranded 
three so far, and after three complete innings of play, still no score. The full Senate has made its choices. William Rehnquist becomes Chief Justice of the United States, and Antonin Scalia has been confirmed as a Supreme Court Justice. Rehnquist was confirmed 65 to 33. That's the highest number of negative votes given any Supreme Court Justice ever confirmed. Rehnquist replaces the retiring Chief Justice Warren Burger. Television evangelist Pat Robertson told a large crowd in Washington he will run for president if he gets three million signatures over the next year. Education Secretary William Bennett sharply criticized Robertson for a comment which suggested Christian activists are more patriotic and family-loving than other people. Another bomb exploded in Paris today, this one killing five and injuring more than 50. It's the fifth terrorist attack in Paris in the past 10 days. The Arab groups claimed responsibility for some of those blasts as the United States is next, and a statement mentioned skyscrapers and the Statue of Liberty. The New York Mets have become the first team to make the playoffs, taking the National League Eastern Division, beating the Chicago Cubs 4 to nothing. I'm Mary Margaret Myers. Thank you, Mary Margaret. And uh, we'll tell you also, Boston, of course, has beaten Milwaukee 4-1, to one, and Baltimore and Detroit have done Boston a favor and not done New York and Toronto any favor at all. Baltimore's beaten New York 8-3, to three. Detroit's beaten Toronto 8-6, to six. and, of course, that puts New York and Toronto now a full 10 games behind the Boston Red Sox. And the uh, Red Sox magic number was uh, going into Wednesday 9. It is now 7 as a result of the Boston win and the New York and Toronto losses. We go to the fourth inning, and Don Sutton will be facing the top of the order. Again, Wilson, Smith, and then Law. Don, coming out of the shoot very strong here this evening, has shut down the first nine that he's faced. Sutton builds to the windup, and the pitch is a fastball high for ball one. Just a couple of added notes for you about Don Sutton as he starts again and the 1-0 pitch fails high and inside the count is 2-0 oh. his start this evening is 702 that is second only to Cy Young who has 818 in his major league history John is 6th in strikeouts with 3,423 2 old pitches on the way and Wilson swings and misses for a strike the count is now 2-1 he is ninth in shutout with 58 he is 11th in innings pitched at 4,974 and 2 thirds Time three and four against Kansas City. He has owned one this year. Sutton builds the windup and the two one delivery he is swung on and missed. That time the screwball heading out in front and the count is two and two. Really Wilson, with that great speed, has hit safely in six of the last seven. When you look at the Kansas City lineup, their first three batters all can run. Two two pitch, swung on and missed, back three. Sutton records his first strikeout of the game after falling behind with a 2-0 count. Then strikes out Wilson. That brings up Lonnie Swift, their designated hitter. The first three batters in Kansas City's lineup, Wilson, Smith, and Law, they have stolen bases like this, 30, 26, and 13. Wilson has stolen 30 of 38. Here's the first pitch to Smith. And he swings and pops it up behind home. Lonnie Smith has stolen 26 of 34 attempts. And Ruby Law is 13 out of 19. And so you can see the key as far as this ball club is concerned, you want to keep the first three guys off the bases. Here's the 0-1 pitch on the way. And it is just inside, and the count goes to 1-1. Sutton here at the Big A has won nine of his 14 games. So he has been very effective here on the confines of the Big A. Although he has had his troubles against Western Division teams. 1-1 one, one pitch. Inside again, and it goes to 2-1. John has won five games against the West. He's won nine against the Eastern Division teams. Two one deliveries on the way. And it's a curveball over for a strike, 2-2. Two two. Sutton has now set down the first 10 that he's faced. Lonnie Smith flying out to center field his first time up, working on an 11-game hitting streak. Here's the 2-2 pitch, and it's popped up behind first base. Back goes Gritch, over is Polidor, and it's Gus Polidor in the outfield grass making the play, and Lonnie Smith is retired. That is 11 in a row set down by Sutton. And brings up the left fielder, Rudy Law. Rudy Law. Law 
slide out to right field. His first time up, he's 0 for 1. Did not play in last night's game. And the first pitch is low and outside, ball one. The Texas Rangers won this afternoon against the Oakland A's. So if the Angels want to hold on to their nine-game lead, they have to win tonight. There's a pitch that goes outside. And the count is 2-0. Law batting 256, one home run, and 34 runs driven in. They play him straight away. Here's the 2 0 pitch by Sutton, and it is on the outside corner for a strike, 2 and 1. Sometimes Jim Evans, the home plate umpire, will ring up that right hand, and it's pretty much on a delayed call. Here's the 2 1 pitch on the way. Curveball pulled down the right field line, and that is looking foul. And so the count goes to two and two. Kansas City this year did not do what they had done in the previous, oh, who knows how many years. They have a reputation of getting off to a slow start, which they did this year. But then the second half of the season, they always come on strong, and that did not happen this year. One of the few times Kansas City did not put on a good spurt the second half. There's a drive hit down the left field line, splicing down and giving chase, and it just goes foul. So Law will have to come back. It was only fouled by about three or four feet. To give you an example, since the All-Star break, Kansas City has played right at the 500 mark, 28 and 28. And within Western Division teams, they're right at the 500 mark. And those are the two categories where Kansas City has always been very, very tough. It seems like they've always beaten up the teams within the division, and they have played extremely well the second half of the season. Well, that has not been the case this year. 2-2 pitch. He is low and outside, so it's a full count now, 3-2. But don't sell them short. They still have a good ball club. Just because they start 15 and a half games behind, I think that's a little bit misleading. Here's the 3-2 pitch, and it's a soft looper just over the head of Schofield in the left field. Downing up with it, getting it back to the infield, and so the string stops at 11. Sutton retires the first 11 before giving up a base hit to Rudy off. And so with two men away, that brings up Jamie Quirk. Quirk bounced out to the pitcher his only time up. So he is 0 for 1. Keep an eye on Rudy Law at first base. As we mentioned, he has 13 stolen bases. There goes Noe. The runner does not go, and the curveball is swung on a miss. Quick throw down to first base, and Rudy Law has to dive back in. A count of 0-1. Quirk batting 216, five home runs, and 20 runs driven in. He is playing third base in place of George Pratt here this evening. Still no score. Sutton with a sign from Boone. A look to first base, and now Sutton goes over to first. On deck is Frank White. Sutton a little bit more deliberate now. Quickly goes to first base again. The way this game has been going, the way that Danny Jackson's been pitching, very similar to last night, it may not take very many runs. That is to win it. Sutton again ready. He holds, and now quickly steps off the rubber and looks the runner back. So a little cat and mouse game going on in the field right now between Sutton and Rudy Law. Down again ready. He holds. And goes to first base. Now, that may be a good thing as far as Sutton is concerned, but the guys playing defense behind him, they're going to get caught on their heels. Because after a while, they're going to start to expect that Sutton's going to go to first base and he go ahead and make the pitch, and they get caught. Here's the next pitch. Pitch out, nothing doing. Rudy Law was not going, so the count is now 1-1. One thing Sutton is displaying, though, Ron, is a different look with each set move. He is not just doing the same thing over and over. I would imagine for Law, who hasn't seen him in a long time, it's got to be tough read. I still think Jeff Zahn did it as well as anyone. Sutton comes set, and the curveball is popped up down the left field line, down and giving chase, 
has a ways to go in foul territory, and he makes the play. So Quirk flies out to Downing to end the inning. And for Kansas City, no runs and a base hit. They leave one, and after three and a half, Kansas City nothing. Angels nothing. In case you missed any of the Tuesday action, let's recap those for you briefly. Then we'll get to uh, what's been happening on a Wednesday state side. In the National League on Tuesday, Montreal defeated Chicago 4-1. to It was Houston 6, Cincinnati 1. Atlanta over L.A. 3-1. to Philly took Pittsburgh 9-5. to New York over St. Louis 4-2. to And San Francisco beat San Diego 4-1. to In the American, Texas 10, Oakland 6. Boston took two from Milwaukee on Tuesday, two to one the first game, nine to three in the nightcap. New York over Baltimore, eight to one. Minnesota beat Cleveland, seven to three. Toronto six to four over Detroit. California beat Kansas City in the first of this three-game series with the Royals, six to five. And Seattle blank Chicago, seven to nothing. All kinds of finals in now. Montreal has beaten Pittsburgh, six to five. And then Pittsburgh coming back in that doubleheader and whipping Montreal 4-1. to one. Houston over Cincy, 6-1. to one. St. Louis has beaten Philly, 8-5. to five. Mets over the Cubs, 4-2. to two. Atlanta's defeated Los Angeles, 4-1. to one. We'll give you more scores a little bit later. In the fourth inning for the Angels, it'll be DeSensei, Hendrick, and then Gritch. We'll be facing Danny Jackson. There's still no score in the ballgame. You know, Fan Appreciation Day is just around the corner, and that, that list of gifts that will be given away when it gets larger and larger. In fact, there's going to be a pickup truck, camper shell, a cab hive from Stockton Company in Irvine, a round trip for two to San Francisco from L.A. via Airtown, Bushnell binoculars from Ocean View binoculars in Newport Beach, a two-night stay for two at the Gene Autry Hotel in Palm Springs, two sets of four passes to the loft stop in Santa Ana, or to the last stop, rather, in Santa Ana, and there's going to be much, much more. That's September 28th, Fan Appreciation Day, right here at the Big A. Here's the sensei, and the first pitch is inside for ball one. He's our TMPC, Security Pacific designated hitter for this game, so you want to keep track of what Doug does. Danny Jackson winds, and the 1-0 pitch is hit high and deep to the right field. Back goes Law. See you later. one nothing Angels. in the major league going to hold that one as the sensei hits his 24th home run of the year RBI number 90 and the Angels are on top you know Rob that is an unusual event when Danny Jackson is pitching because if there's one thing he has been very good at in the last couple of years and that's limiting home runs by the opposition here's George Henrik and the first pitch misses for ball one he's given up 11 this year before that one that makes 12 now and 7 all of last year and that's a very low total for a starter as he is yeah, you're right about that. Next pitch is over for a strike. But there wasn't any doubt about that one. Doug DeSensei, the second half of the season, has hit 14 home runs and driven in 43. Here's the 1-1 pitch. And George Hendrick jacked nothing out of the way. That almost got him. He really had to hurry to get out of the way of that pitch, and the count goes to 2-1. and one. Well, that ball went about half the way back into those red seats beyond the left field fence. Between the 362 and 370 marker. That's a long way, folks, because those seats don't go up very high, but they go back far. And so when you hit one about half the way back into those seats, that's a long way. Hendrick fouls one back. That account remains two and two. Speaking of that, we saw in batting practice today <laughs> something that even makes the Sensei's home run look a little pale. Well, you're talking about Bo. <laughs> that's right. Bo Jackson. 2-2 pitch to Henrik. There's a chopper toward third. Quirk coming in. He gloves it. Throws the first out of time. Henrik beats it out. So George Hendrick picks up his first hit of the game. And that brings up Bobby Gritch. Just remind He's one for one. And the pitch by Jackson. Gritch around the butt, and he takes one right around the knees for a strike. So manager Gene Mock playing little ball here. Asking Bobby Gritch to bump Hendrick along. And that maybe 
Burleson or Polidor can drive in a run. Angels on top, one nothing. What Al was referring to in batting practice prior to the ball game. There's a toss to first base and Hendrick is back. Bo Jackson hit one about three quarters of the way back into the seats where Doug just launched one. And then he almost hit one to dead center field beyond the green tarp. It went way back there. Gritch around the butt takes this one inside, even up ten. And anyone who's been to Anaheim Stadium and has looked out to center field and sees the green top covering the seats out there beyond the fence has to just marvel at the fact anyone could hit the ball that far. I can hit one that far. But yeah, it, with your golf club. But maybe. it says title is on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you might have to pull out the driver to do it. One ball, one strike. Bobby, one for three in last night's game. In fact, if you take a look at Gritchie over the last month, the last 31 ball games, he has really been hitting well. There's a toss to first base. The last 31 games, Bobby batting 310. He has 31 hits and exactly 100 at bats. So he really and truly has had a really good 31 game. There's a swing and a foul tip off of the mask of the catcher. Now the count is now one and two. Actually, Ron, you go down the lineup. Pettis, Schofield, Downing, Desinze, Hendrick, Rich, Boone. They've all had good second half, and that's why the Angels have had oh, so many wins. That's right. Well, if you just take a look at the last 20 games, for example, here's the 1-2 pitch, and it's fouled away off to our right, and it remains at 1-2. and two. The Angels have won 16 of the last 20. Well, you've got to win 17 of 20 to gain any ground. The Angels started that last road trip with a 7.5 game lead, and they came home with a 9 game lead. They picked up a game and a half of the Rangers. Here's the next pitch by Jackson, and it's inside with a curveball. The count goes to two and two. Did you read Larry Parrish's quote in the paper today? Yeah, I, I saw that this morning, and he says the only hope for the Texas Rangers <laughs> is if the Angels have the bottom fall out on them. That's a fairly good assessment. Two-two pitch. Foul straight back again. The count remains at two and two. He also added that we're going to have to win just about every game. Yep. And that may not be enough. Two balls, two strikes to Bobby. He's batting 288. And with that last base hit, he's batting 290. There's a curveball hit well to center field, but not well enough. Wilson is waiting for it. And he makes the catch, and there's out number one. You know, Ron, earlier in the broadcast, I started to bring up something. If you're listening to this on any YouTube channel other than Classic Baseball on the Radio, be sure to check out the YouTube channel Classic Baseball on the Radio. This game was first posted. About Danny Jackson, we were cut off as the inning were ended. I wonder if I can get your feedback on it now. During the World Series, the Cardinals apparently were impressed with the Royal pitching staff, but of all of the starters, Saberhagen, Kubaza, Jackson, Lee Brand, it was Danny Jackson who most impressed them. What are your thoughts on him as a pitcher? Well, I'm trying to figure out how he's 10 and 10, because in watching him pitch, I've always thought he's a much better pitcher than that. There's a tailing fastball outside for ball one to Rick Burleson. Burley is 0 for 1. And having never hit off of him, it is tough to really make an accurate evaluation, but based upon what I've seen, he should have better numbers than what he has posted. There's one that's in the dirt, gets, and Sunberg blocks it and then can't find it. Down to second base goes Hendrick. There for a second, Sunberg looked like the ball was in front of him, but apparently could not see it, and then all of a sudden was looking all over the place. And that allowed Hendrick to go down to second base. I'm sure they're going to charge a wild pitch. And the ball is was sitting in the batter's box in front of Rick Burleson. <laughs> that was a, a quirk. I should say that. That was a sunbird. Or or a sunbird. He's a third. <laughs> ERA of 3.49, though, Al. That's not bad. That's very good. That's pretty good as far as they evaluate pitchers today. 2-0 pitch. He is outside 3-0. So let's see if Burley's given the green light. He has been in a slight slump. He's... Uh, he has three hits in his last 21 at bats. Let's see if Gene Mock gives him the green light. Hendrick with the lead at second base. And the 3-0 pitch is high, ball four. That is the first base on balls issued by Jackson. Let's pause for station identification. You're listening to the Angels Radio Network. Pretty fast-moving game so far. We hope you're enjoying it. The Angels and the Kansas City Royals. The Angels sure want to wrap up that American West, and they may be on the way to doing it. This is the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
There's Josh Polidor standing in. Jackson looks back to second base, and the left-hander's pitch is on the inside corner for a strike. Gus bounced out to second. He's only time up. Hendrick at second. Burleson at first. Angels lead at one nothing. Jackson with a sign from Sunberg. And the strike one pitch is on the inside corner for strike two. And so Polidor, having a rough time pulling the trigger here, has fallen behind 0-2. Bianca and White, a double play depth near the bag at second. The strike two pitch is a bouncer toward third. Quirk has it to White for one. On to first base. The sights here, and they turn the double play. So Polidor hits into a 5-4-3 double play. And for the Angels in their half of the inning, they come up with one run and two hits. A home run by Doug DeSense, his 24th of the year. A man is left. And after four complete here at the Big A, Angels won. Kansas City nothing. And if you're joining us late, Kansas City Royals visiting at the Big A at Anaheim Stadium in Anaheim, California. And, of course, our play-by-play man, Al Conan, assisted by Ron Fairley on the Angels Network out of KMBC, Los Angeles. Let's wrap up those uh, scores for you, by the way. Texas over Oakland, four to nothing. Baltimore... Defeated the Yankees 8-3. to Detroit beat Toronto 8-6. to It was Cleveland 5, Minnesota 2. Boston took Milwaukee 4-1. to Two uh, games still going on aside from ours. Bottom of the fourth, it's the White Sox and Seattle scoreless. Top of the fifth, San Diego leading San Francisco 1 to nothing. Earlier in the National League, Montreal defeated Pittsburgh 6-5. to And then Pittsburgh came back in that uh, second game of that doubleheader, defeated Montreal 4-1. to Houston took Cincinnati 6-1. to St. Louis over Philadelphia 8-5. to Mets took Chicago. 4-2, and Atlanta beat Los Angeles 4-1. to Dodgers having a terrible time this year. And the Mets, uh, by uh, beating Chicago, of course, have clinched the National East. Here's the way it looks in the uh, American West right now with the uh, Texas win over Oakland. Texas is now eight and a half games behind the Angels. Then it's Kansas City, 15 and a half, and then you get down into the, uh, the big numbers. Oakland, 18, Seattle, 20, Chicago, 20 and a half. And Minnesota down in the cellar, 22. In the American East, Boston leading New York and Toronto now by 10 games as a result of the Boston win over Milwaukee and New York and Toronto dropping respectively to Baltimore and Detroit. Well, we have completed four innings of play here at the Big A. Right now, the Angels lead it by a score of one to nothing. It'll be White, Seitzer, and Jackson to be facing Don Sutton, who is pitching a very strong game for the Angels. And once again, returning to the microphone, here's Al Conner. All right, Ron, the Angels with the lead. Don Sutton trying to make it stand up, and his first one to White is a fastball a little high. One blow, no strike. Frank popped up to short in the second inning. And he's trying to get the Royals started here in the fifth. Sutton into his windup, and the 1-0 delivery is a fastball a little high, 2-0. The only run, as you heard Ron describe, a solo home run by Douglas Sensei, number 24 on the year for him, and that leads the club. He also has 90 RBIs now, and he's got a good shot at 100 before the year's over. That would be a career high for him. The 2-0 pitch to White is on the inside corner, 2-1. So the Angels on top, but this one far from over. A 1-0 lead against a good team like the Royals, certainly, well, certainly not enough, you would think. The 2-1 pitch is outside and high, ball three. 3-1 three to Frank White. Both pitchers have been sharp tonight, particularly Sutton has given up just one hit. That is single to left by Rudy Lowell last inning. Don builds to the windup, and it's 3-1 to Frank White. High pop fly behind second base, shallow center field. Schofield and Polidor are there, and it's Gus Polidor to make the catch. So White skies to his counterpart, second baseman Polidor, and that'll bring up Kevin Seitzer. Banjo certainly folks at Farmers Insurance have discovered that And here's Seitzer. He's hitting 316 in his brief stint as a big leaguer. He has been very impressive and versatile, too. Sutton starts him. And the first pitch is a breaking ball on the inside corner for a strike, 1-1. One, one. Seitzer, we're seeing as a first baseman, but the Royals have used him at third base and in the outfield, too. At time called Bob Boone, Summoned out by Sutton to have a brief conversation as they discuss strategy against Seitzer and also, undoubtedly, the sign sequence they're using here. The 
Snipes is certainly a versatile athlete. And as we discussed before, he has a good compact swing, and that has been noted by both sides of the field. There's a breaking ball outside, one and one to him. On deck, Bo Jackson. Jim Sundberg after that. The Angels and the Royals going at it here in the fifth inning. And it's one nothing Angels. Don Sutton cranks it up. The 1-1 delivery is just blown away, 2-1. For Sutton, this is his second start against the Royals this year. He had a no decision back in June. He's 3-3 three three lifetime. Seitzer takes a breaking ball a little low, make it 3-1 to him. It has been a most memorable year for Don Sutton. He won his 300th game of his career back in June. The 3-1 pitch, and it's high and away, ball four, and Sutton issues a rare walk. In fact, his first of the game, and Bo Jackson will come up. Sutton also, with his victory over Oakland in August, completed a rare feat, having beaten every team in the major leagues now. Just a few days ago, he got his 100 strikeout of this year. That's 21 consecutive years he's done that. And what has to be so amazing about all of these accomplishments, Sutton at 41, still going strong. He has 309 career victories. And he's leading tonight. Here's Jackson, and he grounds the first pitch to short. Schofield has it, goes to second for one. On to first in the dirt, and Rich digs it out, but doesn't get the call from first base umpire Derwood Merrill. And Rich just throws up his arms just to say, why not? And the answer from Merrill was pretty simple. I don't think you got him. But the force on Seitzer completed six to four. Jackson aboard on the fielder's choice, although the Angels thought they completed the twin killing. But Bo could motor down the line. So two outs, and Sunberg will step in. Sutton delivers to him, and it's swung on and fouled away on one. You know, with all the speed that Bo Jackson has, one day he may become a big base dealer, too. He certainly could learn the mechanics of a quicker start, and he has the raw speed to outrun most catchers' throws. So, among his many potential attributes, base stealing might be one of them. Boy, it's unbelievable all the things he can do. The strike one, Sunberg, the tech swing, and he went around. Or did he? Let's double check. One ball, one strike to count to Sunberg. Played umpire Jim Evans saying no, he did not. Two outs, we're in the fifth. One nothing Angels. Jackson at first base, Sunberg at the play. And Sutton goes over and drives Jackson back. Oh, Jackson, he can hit for power. He can run like the wind. It'll be interesting to see how his career goes. There's a fastball inside, two and one. Really, the American League has been blessed with some great young talent this year. Conseco, Joyner, Incavillia, Tartable. Some of the young pitchers have come along. Bo Jackson now added to the list. That bodes well for the future. The American League really piling up some stars. And really, I think on balance, if you compare them to the National League, they've got a better crop right now. That's just my opinion anyway. Here's the 2-1 delivery. There goes Jackson. The pitch is inside to throw to second. Not nearly in time. And the ball goes on into center field. Jackson gets up and goes to third, and he makes it there easily. For Bo Jackson, that is his second stolen base as a big leaguer. And he forces an error on Boone as well. Well, there's an example of what we were talking about. He beat that play without any problem at all. He didn't do it in textbook fashion. Looked like he went in with an awkward head-first slide. But there was no doubt at all that he had made the play. So the tying run is at third base now with the count three and one on Sunberg. one nothing Angels in the fifth. Sutton into the windup and the pitch. And it's low, ball four, and that's the second walk Don has issued in the inning. And that is really rare for him. He came in with only 40 walks all year in some 30 starts, so you don't have to be a mathematician to realize he rarely walks more than one a game, and here he has walked two in an inning. And that has been the Kansas City rally in this frame. They don't have a base hit yet. 
Buddy Biancolano stepping in, trying to provide it. Sutton delivers, and his fastball is on the outside corner. Strike one. Two outs, runners at the corners for the Royals. Sutton protecting a one nothing lead. Jackson at third, Sunberg at first. The strike one to Biancolano is a breaking ball that's just outside. Boone holding it there for plate umpire Jim Evans, who said, nope, just missed. The total is one-sided right now. One run, five hits for the Angels. No runs, just one hit for the Royals. Biancolano popped up to third his first time up, and he swings and fouls one at the plate. One and two. Last night, Ron told you that Buddy Biancolano has just two home runs. Both of them came against the Angels in a series in June. One was hit off of Ron Romanek and the other off of Don Sutton. And thus the Angels calling him the babe Bianca Lana. Sutton has him one and two. Don starts to deliver but time called and Bianca Lana backs away. Lots of room in right center for the young shortstop who's been alternating at the short pass this year with Angel Salazar. Next one is cut out of miss, strike three, a fastball, and Bianca Lana went after a bad one. It was up and in, and he couldn't lay off. So Don Sutton gets into some trouble of his own making in the fifth inning, but he extricates himself. No runs, no hits, no errors. Two men left at the corners, and will head to the bottom of the fifth. Angels one, Royals nothing. Here's a story you may have missed on Tuesday, and uh, we think it might be of interest enough to uh, be worth repeating. Seven fired employees of the Los Angeles Dodgers and two of their girlfriends have been charged with embezzling more than $332,000 from the Dodgers between 1983 and 1985. The district attorney's office in Los Angeles says that former payroll clerk Edward Campos conspired with the other employees to credit them from hours for hours that they didn't work. Five of those workers were security guards. The other, uh, the other, the seventh is also a uh, clerk for the Dodgers, or was, certainly no longer now. Campos, who worked for the Dodgers for 18 years, is also accused of padding payroll checks and adding the names of two girlfriends and also some fictitious names to the Dodger payroll. Prosecutors say that Campos got about a 50% kickback on the paycheck, and this alleged embezzlement was uncovered by an employee who took over Campos' duties when he became ill in June of last year. None of the former Dodger employees... Uh, fired because of this alleged scheme were players. We emphasize that. So again, some $332,000 allegedly embezzled from the Dodgers between 1983 and 1985. Well, the American League batting race heating up considerably on uh, Tuesday. Wade Boggs was the leader, 351. Don Mattingly right behind him at 348. They both did nicely on Tuesday. Mattingly a little better. Now it's Boggs 352, Mattingly 350. Welcome back to Anaheim Stadium. I'm Al Conan with Ron Fairley and Dick Nelson. Nice to have you with us as this series with the Royals continues. Angels leading at one to nothing on Doug DeSensei's fourth inning home run. And speaking of home runs, with this being the home half of the fifth, it's time to play the Chevy home run contest. Bob Boone stepping in to begin things. Jackson delivers to him, and a breaking ball is swung on a miss going on. In the jackpot tonight, $300. And our contestant, Susan Kintz of Upland. Jackson right back to the plate, and the 0-1 to Boone is on the inside corner, make it 0-2. Boone, of course, the hero last night, and he could become a hero tonight to Susan Kintz with a home run here. Jackson strike two pitch as a fastball outside, 1-2. If an angel to hit a grand slam in this inning, Susan would win either her choice of a 1986 Chevy Nova or S-10 pickup. The one-two to Bob Boone is a line drive at second baseman Frank Wide, who takes a step or two to his left and makes the catch. So Boone hits it on the button, but is retired. And that'll bring up Gary Pettis, who has grounded a second and butted successfully toward third. So one down, and Gary step again. We're in the Chevy home run inning. $300 in a jackpot for Susan Kintz of Upland. Gary Pettis taking his turn. He's hit in 10 of his last 12 ball games, so he's been swinging well. In fact, He's up close to 340 during September. There's a fastball high to him, 1-0. He's had a good last month. Schofield has. So is Downing, obviously, to Sensei. The Angels collectively have been playing very well. Jackson's next pitch is cut on a miss, 1-1. One one. Gary up there right-handed, and as you know, from this side of the plate, he generally does better than from the other. 
He's hitting 280 as a right-hand batter, 252 from the left side. The 1-1 one -one delivery, and it's down low to him. Two balls and a strike. Bottom of the fifth inning here at the Big A. The Angels enjoying a one to nothing lead. They won last night trying to win tonight. Fastball is outside to Pettis in the count three and one. And Jackson certainly does not want to walk in if he can avoid it. So Jackson stole a base in the top of the inning. Gary Pettis would be a good candidate to do the same should he get aboard in the bottom of the inning. The pitch to Gary is swung on a miss. Good slider in on the hand. Three and two. Danny Jackson out of the University of Oklahoma. Only 24. And he figures to be a mainstay for the Royals for some years to come yet. He cranks it up once more. The 3-2 to Pettis is a fly ball lifted down the right field line. That'll slice, though, and drift back into the crowd. So it's still full to Pettis, 3-2. and two. One out, bottom of the fifth, one nothing Angel. Halo's facing another left-hander, Lee Brandt last night. Jackson tonight. They're 22-21 and 21 against lefties this year. Pettis swings over the top of a breaking ball and strikes out. And that's only the second K for Jackson in the game, and that'll set the stage for Schofield, who has one hit and two trips tonight. The Angels, while they are one game over 500 against lefties, as we have told you from time to time, since June 1st, they have turned things around against lefties. They're 19-9. The pitch to Schofield inside, make it 1-0. Oh. Of course, everything's been going well for them. They've won the close ones. They've come from behind. They've gotten great pitching. They've gotten the long ball. There's a ground ball to the hole. That's short and through in the left field of Schofield, two for three. Woody Law up to get the ball, brings it back in. So the Angels now with six hits against Jackson, although this one comes with two outs. And Brian Downing will get a chance to swing. And he's 0 for 2, fouling the first in the opening inning, striking out looking to end the third. But you know the Angels, 23 games over 500 right now. They have a chance to do something no other Angel club has done. There's a fastball outside. Check that inside to Downing 1 and 0. And that something is win more than 93 games. They can get up there even beyond 95 if they stay hot. The 1-0 pitch, and it's down low, 2-0. The magic number for the Angels, of course, is 10. They'd like to drop it to 9. But for Gene Moss, the magic number is different. His magic number is 7. He wants them to win 90 games, and they're 7 away from doing that. Jackson's 2-0 to Downing finds the inside edge, 2-1. Of course, you've heard Gene's explanation for why he feels that's important. He just doesn't see the Rangers or any other team reaching that plateau other than the Angels. So if they get there, he feels they're home free. Schofield drives a throw over to first base, and you can understand what Jackson's thinking about. While Pettis gets all the headlines as far as the base stealing is concerned on the Angels, Schofield can steal his share, too. He has 22. Only been caught about four times this year. Downing lets one go by inside, 3-1. and one. one nothing Angels, bottom of the fifth. Two outs, Schofield at first. Brian Downing at the plate, trying to find a way to break through on Danny Jackson. The next pitch is high, ball four, and the Angels have something building here in the fifth inning. With two outs, Schofield has single to left, Downing has walked. Now here's the Sixay who has already homered in the ball game to establish the one nothing lead. Now just a quick math, a little bit of math work here. If the Angels win seven more games for Texas to tie the Angels, the Rangers have to win 14 of the last 16. And seven games with 19 to play doesn't seem like that tough of an assignment. The pitch to the Sensei is way high, 1-0. Oh. Well, with each passing day, the calendar working against the Rangers, and Ron's illustration there with the number certainly showing you why. Two on, two out to Sensei White. The 1-0 from Jackson is low and inside, make it 2-0. Danny has already been stung by the long ball off the bat of the Sensei, and he is pitching cautiously only to fall behind. 
at time call, his catcher, Jim Sundberg, comes out to the mound to have a visit with him. In the bullpen in left field for the Royals, there is some activity. We can't quite discern who it is, but we can see the ball flying around out there. And Sundberg comes back behind the dish. In the inning, Boone lined out to second. Pettis then struck out, but Schofield singles through the hole on the left side. Downing walks, and now it's to Sensei with the count his way 2-0. The pitch from Jackson is way high and outside. Ball three, and it looked like he reached back for something extra there. Let him hit. Why not? He's the one man in your lineup, one of the couple who could break the game open with one swing. Jackson ready to pitch, but DeSensei is not ready to hit, so time called, just as Jackson was about to unleash it. one nothing Angels, bottom of the fifth. We're in the Chevy home run contest. And DeSintre with that home run potential. Schofield at second, downing at first, one nothing Angels. The 3-0 is on the inside corner, 3-1. So they may have given DeSintre the green light, but the pitch was not to his liking. It would be hard to tell whether or not he was, because it was a tough pitch to handle. The 3-1 is a check swing, and that's going to cost him strike two. Doug started to move toward first base. But first base umpire Derwood Merrill, who's already drawn the ire of the Angels from a call last inning, doesn't make DeSensei too happy as he brings up the right hand, and it's three and two. I think Doug would just soon hit anyway. A base on balls doesn't do anything for you. As we mentioned, after his home run, he has 90 RBIs, seven shy of his career best, Ten shy of the century mark. A plateau he has never reached. The 3-2. There go the runners. And it's foul tip into Sunbird. Cloud strike three. And the sensei is going to argue. He's going to argue that the ball missed the bat. He was on his way to first base. But plate umpire Jim Evans says no. It hit the bat. You're out. And the inning is over. So while the sensei argues, we can tell you we didn't have a winner in our Chevy home run contest. And our jackpot increases tomorrow to $325. And there'll always be that chance of the big prize, a new Chevy Nova or S10 pickup, if an angel hits a grand slam. So here in the fifth for the angels, no run. One hit, no errors. They leave two, and we'll head to the sixth inning. Still, angels won, and the Royals nothing. And if you're joining us late, this is, of course, the uh, Royals visiting the angels at Anaheim. Danny Jackson starting for the Royals, still pitching with a 10-10 and record. And uh, Don Sutton, the starter for the Angels, and uh, he is still doing his thing, 14-9 and nine on the season. And in case you didn't hear the news, the Mets, pretty well certifying what uh, most of us had concluded some time back, have clinched the National East Division with a 4-2 to victory over the Chicago Cubs. Dwight Gooden pitching a six-hitter. Dave Magadan went three for four, giving the Mets 95 victories, more than the second-place Phillies could achieve, even by winning the rest of their games. There was a crowd of 47,823 cheering under a full moon. Gooden raised his record to 15 and 6. Dennis Eckersley took the loss. Dennis now 6 and 10 on the year. And the Mets finally wrapped up a title they could have really formalized some five days ago when they started that uh, series with the Phillies. Magan in a late replacement for first baseman Keith Hernandez is down with the virus. Produced his first Major League RBI with third and fifth inning singles. Gooden lacking his best stuff in this game, but he struck out seven, walked four, and this is Dwight's 11th complete game of the season. The enthusiasm of the fans began building with nine outs to go, reached a crescendo with one out to go, and the fans begin chanting, we're number one, we're number one, and so they are. Gooden struck out when he uh, struck out eight, by the way. He retired Chico Walker for the last out. The crowd just went into a frenzy. Many of them had gone onto the field already in fair territory before the final out, and some 5,000 people were on the field as soon as second baseman Wally Backman threw to first baseman Keith Hernandez for the final out. And uh, that was it. No other National League East team has ever clinched the title that early. We'll tell you more about that at our next break. Let's get back. Here in the sixth inning, Willie Wilson leading it off against Sutton. one nothing Angels. Wilson already up there with the count one and one. Sutton kicks and delivers again, and it's popped up right around second base. Shortstop Dick Schofield calling for it, and he makes the catch. So just like that, a man is gone, and that'll bring up Lonnie Smith, 
who has slide to center and top to second. Bomber jump. Smith has been smoking the baseball. As we mentioned, 11 consecutive games in which he's hit. He takes the fastball high, 1-0. In fact, he is making a run at the 300 mark. Nothing new for Lonnie Smith. Well, in the National League, he had several 300 years. In fact, his lifetime average in the senior circuit, close to 300. He swings and foul tips one into Boone's Love, 1-1. One and one. And you look back on Lonnie Smith's track record, 339 average at Philadelphia in 1980, 324 in 81. Only hit 257 last year with Kansas City, but much better than that this year, and it appears he's made the adjustment to the new league. The 1-1 pitch is a fastball high, 2-1. Ron, we had the bottom of the fifth inning end on an unusual note, a foul tip call by plate umpire Jim Evans for strike three to end the inning, and Desente argued vehemently and you would think he would know if there had been a foul tip. The pitch to Smith is pulled down the left field line foul. So it's even now two and two. And it just seemed to me that that was unusual. Your thoughts on the way that inning ended? Well, normally if that ball hits the bat ever so slightly, you're going to feel it. The only thing I'm going on, I took a look at the replay, and Sunberg, the catcher, never hesitated. He just went right on off toward the dugout. So apparently the ball did hit the bat. Or at least Sunberg thought so, too. Here's the 2-2 on the way to Lonnie Smith. And it's strike three call. Big bending curve, and Sutton got it in there. Three strikeouts for him. Of course, you can look at it another way, too, Ron. If you're the catcher and you hear Steve Reich three, get out of there. Don't wait to argue about it. But I think your point's well taken. Sunberg, at least you would have thought, might have hesitated, and he didn't. And there are times when that ball hits the glove in just a certain way that it may sound like there's a little tick up there. Here's Rudy Law with two outs, and the pitch to him is away. One ball, no strikes. Rudy, a left-hand swinger. The totals in the ball game, while they are tipped the Angels' way, not overpoweringly so, Law hits a pop fly in the shallow right center field. Pettis, Hendrick, and Polidor all there, and it's Gary Pettis to put the squeeze on it. So in the sixth inning, Don Sutton continues to roll. He's only allowed one hit. That was to Law back in the fourth. And we'll head to the bottom of the sixth. Angels won. Kansas City nothing. We have a little bit of confusion surrounding that uh, at Mets-Cubs uh, game. We uh, said that Dave Magadan replaced Keith Hernandez, who was supposed to be uh, down with a virus. But then <laughs> our copy said that Wally Backman threw to first baseman Keith Hernandez for the final out. So we're not quite sure if Keith was in that game or not. I'm sure he wanted to be for uh, clinching the division. We'll see if we can check up on that and find out what was going on. We did mention that uh, no other National League East team has ever clinched the title this early in the season. Uh, the 1972 Pirates wrapped it up on the uh, 21st of September. They needed only 144 games, though, opposed to New York's 145. And with their third division title, the Mets earned the right, of course, to oppose the West Division champions in the National League playoffs. And uh, we can assume that uh, those will probably be the Astros. Larry King had a uh, little comment the other night, Larry King on Mutual, he said uh, it'll probably be harder for the Mets to get past the Astros than it would be for them to win the World Series. The really big obstacle is getting the uh, the pennant in the National League. And after that, it might just be anticlimactic. So uh, we'll wait and see. The Astros could very well wind up taking uh, the National. Dwight Gooden, as we mentioned, was the uh, winning pitcher. It was kind of chilly in New York uh, as we get into... Uh, early fall, or late summer, really, I still, uh, officially, but uh, early fall, and uh, good was uh, they found him uh, blowing on his hand a little bit to kind of warm it up, but uh, he contended with base runners in almost every inning, but did win the game, and that's what's important. Bottom of the sixth inning at Anaheim Stadium. Good crowd on hand, good ball game to go with it. one nothing. the Angels lead. That home run by DeCense back in the fourth inning still looming is the difference. Danny Jackson towing the rubber. He'll go to work against George Hendrick, who is one for two. Jackson cranks it up and delivers, and his first pitch of this inning is over for a strike called on one. The Angels trying to take yet another step toward that Western Division Championship. The 0-1 pitch, and Hendrick waves at the breeze and doesn't get it on two. And without question, they have their fate in their own hands now. 
Jackson right back 0-2, and Hendrick takes it away, 1-2. and two. As we mentioned, the home run, the big story tonight, that has been the only scoring blow of the game. And it would figure that a home run would be prominent on this date, September 17th. The one-two pitch. It's a line drive in the right field, but Bo Jackson has the beat on it, and he comes on and makes the play. Before we tell you about the home run ball and this date in history, let's pause for station identification. This is the Angels Radio Network. Got a good game going, and hope you're enjoying it around the world, wherever you happen to be listening, and you are listening to it right here on the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Bobby Gritt stepping in here in the sixth inning. one nothing Angels as Jackson misses outside. 1-0. The Brewers of Anheuser... Gritt takes one on the outside corner to even things at 1-1. One one. Burleson on deck. Polidor hoping for a chance in the hole. one nothing Angels in the sixth. Jackson kicks and comes right back to Bobby in the dirt. And Sundberg... Knocks it down, 2-1 and one to Grit. As we were saying before the station break there, this date in baseball history figured very prominently for one individual in particular with reference to the home run ball. That man not in the lineup tonight for the Angels, but here nonetheless, Reggie Jackson. Fastball is high to Grit 3-1. Because on this date, September 17th, 1984, Reggie Jackson hit his 500th career homer. Rich waves at the breeze and doesn't get it, 3-2. and two. He hit it against the Royals, but Black was on the mound that day. And what made it such a special touch was that it was also on this date 17 years before that Reggie Jackson hit his first career home run, and he also did it here at the Big A. Rich hits a line drive in the left field, but Rudy Law goes back a step or two, then puts on the brakes and makes the catch, and Rich is retired for route number two, and that'll bring up Burleson. So Reggie, who has always had a flair for the dramatic, certainly put it all together September 17th. He had his first home run at the Big A, and he hit his 500th home run on the same date 17 years later. Pitch to Burley is a fastball for a strike on one. Jackson right back to the plate, and Burleson swings and misses on two. Got one. One nothing. The Angels leading. Jackson to the plate, and Burleson takes just inside one and two. You know, speaking of Reggie and the flair for the dramatic, I have a feeling he'll be hitting some dramatic home runs before this campaign is over. The one two pitch is grounded foul. Third base way. Still one and two. <laughs> Danny Jackson into the windup, and the one two to Burleson has popped a foul below us here in the press area. So Burleson's still alive. Ron told you earlier that though he's hitting around 285, he's been fighting a slump lately. He's now three for his last. 21. His next pitch is high, so 2-2. Two two. But that gives you a good indication of how it's gone for Burleson. He's come down to 285, 286. And if he warms up again, he'll go back up near that 300 level. He's never hit over 300 in his career. The 2-2 two two pitch is high and tight, and it spins him out of there. So the count full. Two down, base is empty, bottom of the six, one nothing angel. As long as things stand the way they do, we'll be referring back to that fourth inning when Doug DeSensei provided the difference with a solo home run, his 24th of the year. Burleson pulls it foul, third base side, and that kangaroos into the stands and then skips back a few rows. Three and two it remains. Outfield giving Burleson lots of room in left center. The infield pretty much straight away. Danny Jackson nodding yes to Sunberg. Here's the full count offering. Ground ball hit on a big hop towards short. Biancalana waiting for it. Guns over to Seitzer in time. And the inning is over for the Angels. So Jackson's still pitching well. He gets the side in order in the sixth. We'll go to the seventh when Ron returns with the score. Angels one, Royals nothing. 
Now this ABC News brief. We have a new Supreme Court Chief Justice, Senator Paul Tribble, announced the Senate's vote. On this vote, there are 65 yeas and 33 nays. The nomination of William Rehnquist to be Chief Justice of the United States is confirmed. The Senate also has confirmed Antonin Scalia to take the seat being vacated by Rehnquist. That vote was 98 to nothing. The Mets have become the first team to clinch a spot in the Major League playoffs. They beat the Cubs tonight in New York, 4-2. 25 Soviet U.N. diplomats are being kicked out of the U.S. by the Reagan administration. They've got two weeks to get out, and U.S. officials deny that this action has anything to do with the Soviet detention of U.S. reporter Nicholas Danilov. No claims of responsibility yet for the latest bombing in Paris. A bomb today killed five people and injured more than 50 others. The same terrorists who say they've planted five bombs in the French capital in 10 days say that they're going to start staging attacks in the U.S. From ABC News, I'm Marcia Slaughter. Little football news. The Philadelphia Eagles uh, earlier this week have released running back Ernest Jackson. He'd run for 1,028 yards last season, but uh, apparently didn't impress his new coach, Buddy Ryan, former defensive coordinator, of course, of the Bears. Jackson was picked up by the Eagles from the Chargers for two draft picks in September of last year. He was Philadelphia's leading rusher last season, but uh, Ryan and Jackson apparently didn't take to each other. Ryan criticized his blocking, his running, his pass-catching abilities. Well, there wasn't much left else to uh, criticize, so Jackson is gone from the Eagles. Six innings have been played tonight here at Anaheim Stadium. Don Sutton and Danny Jackson putting on a pitching clinic. And right now, the Angels with the best of it leading one to nothing. The only mistake, they fastball to DeSensei in the fourth inning, and Doug turned it around and sent it deep over the left field fence to provide the scoring. Sutton, meanwhile, has allowed just one base hit. That is single by Rudy Law back in the fourth inning. And he goes to work now in the seventh against Jamie Quirk. And going to work again for us. Take you along with a play-by-play. Here's Ron. Thank you very much. I guess that's my lead. I got to hold it, right? That's right. Well, you provided the lead. The least you can do is hold on to it now. Here's the first pitch to Quirk, and there's a curveball high and outside, ball one. Quirk is 0 for 2 in the game. He's bounced down to the pitcher and fired out to left field. Left hand hitter. Well, now and then you have to win something, one to nothing. And two to one. Here's the 1-0 pitch, and it's just outside in the count of Stuno. I feel a little bit for Bob Rowe and his highlight package, though. <laughs> he's going to be he's, he's gonna be one shot. <laughs> He'll be short. And Bob, if you're listening, stretch it out the best you can. Yeah, make, make it live. live. Make it live. Here's the 2-0 <laughs> pitch. And it's looped towards center field. Could be trouble. Pettis coming on. And he's going to have to let it fall for a base hit. So Quirk starts things here in the seventh inning with a blooper to center field. He's now one for three. And that'll bring up the second baseman, Frank White. White this evening has popped up to short and popped up to second base. Sutton started the game by retiring the first 11. And then he set down 13 of 14 before giving up a base on ball. Here's a pitch to White, and it's just outside ball one. You have to be careful with Frank White. When he started his career, it was really not a home run hitter. However, in the last two years, he started playing long ball. He has hit 19 home runs this year and driven in 79. There's a shot that is fouled down the left field line, and that evens up the count. And that's exactly what I mean right there. White had that big end of the bat out in front, and he hit it hard. But he pulled it foul. Take a look at the last two years that... About White in the home run. There's one that's a big bouncer to Gritch at first. He goes to second for the force out. And they do not return the throw. And so credit Bobby Gritch with a good play. As White bounces one to Bobby at first base. And he forces Quirk at second. That is three six in the put out. And that brings up Kevin Seinzer. But just to give you an idea, last year, White hit 22 home runs. That is a career high for him. And he's at 19 this year. And the RBIs by White, 79, that's a career high. So he's having another good year. Here's Kevin Seitzer, the first baseman standing in. Kevin over one. He is lined out to short and then walked. So he is over one. Sutton stepping off the rubber. Seitzer is hit in seven of the ten major league games in which he's played. Really does not have a position as of yet. Here's the first pitch, and it's a curveball outside for ball one. Not that he can't play, and not that he's a bad defensive player. It's just that right now, in the scheme of things, 
he really does not have a set position to play. And there's a chance that maybe he'll be the left fielder next year. Or maybe he'll play a little bit of first base to make him on the house Steve Balboni count. There's pitches outside. The count is now two and off. Balboni hurt, by the way. Along with George Brett. You take those two guys out of the lineup. And that's their home run and RBI men. And this team does not have anywhere near the intimidation factor that it has with those two guys in it. 2-0 pitch. He has swung on and popped up off of first base. Gritch over near the dugout. He is waiting for it, and the ball goes just out of reach. It goes into the first row. And so the count is now 2-1. Two, on deck is Bo Jackson. Angels lead it 1 to nothing. The difference of the ball game, Doug DeSensei's home run. DeSensei has 24 home runs on the year. That's tops in the team. Sutton staring down at Boone. There goes the runner. The pitch is swung on and hit into right field, giving ground as Hendrick. He's there, and he makes the catch, and White has to go back to first base. And so they had the hit and run on. And Seitzer flies out to right field. That's out number two, and that brings up the right fielder, Bo Jackson. Now, you recall last night, just about this time of the game, actually last night it was in the eighth inning, and right now it's in the seventh inning, but Jackson with a two-run homer to right field to tie the game at five. And then the Angels came right back and they won it when Boone singled into right field to drive in Devon White. So here he is, nothing but power standing in. And the first pitch is low and outside, ball one. Jackson is batting 313, two home runs, four runs driven in. He has hit in six of the eight major league games that he has played in. And there is not a point in any ballpark that he can't hit it out of. The 1-0 pitch, and Sutton starting to make the pitch slip to the mound and stop, and that's a ball. He started to make a pitch and then slipped. And now the tying run is in scoring position. But as you think it through just for a second, that is a very smart move by Don Sutton because he was in the middle of his wind-up and something slipped, and he had enough agility in his mind to stop because if he throws the pitch to Jackson and makes a bad pitch, Jackson can hit one out of here. And so Sutton stopping, and now all he has to do, hopefully, is that is get Jackson out. But he did not want to make that one bad pitch if he had slipped out there in the mound. Here's the 1-0 pitch, and it's blowing off. Oh, it's blowing inside. Once again, it looked like Jim Evans is going to ring up a strike, and the count is now 2-0. I have seen pitchers on the mound slip and end up throwing it right down the middle of the plate and have it cost him some runs. Sutton at the belt and the 2-0 pitch. He has swung on and missed for a strike, a fastball right in on the letters. And the count is 2-1. Sutton has struck out three in the game. He has 111 on the year. with the lead at second base. Sutton checking him. And the 2-1 pitch is a curveball. Swung out and missed strike two. And that evens up the count of two balls and two strikes. Now Jackson stepping out. Having a quick clubhouse meeting with himself. And now Bo stepping right back in. He does have holes. He is just a young man, as you well know. But within time, those holes will get smaller and smaller. Here's the 2-2 pitch. And it's a curveball low and outside. Full count now, 3-2. and two. Three balls and two strikes. Jackson stepping out. And going through that same thing again. Sutton staring down. flashing the signs. Jackson has struck out. Since coming up, we'll give you that here in just a second. He has struck out nine times in 30 at-bats. Sutton now with the signs. And the 3-2 pitch he is high and inside. He walked in. And down to first base goes Jackson. That is the third base on balls. 
issued by Sutton and Sunberg. The next scheduled hitter has been called back. Let's see. So Mike Ferraro goes to here. You have a guy sitting on the bench that wears number five, and if you know who I'm talking about, if you're familiar with Kansas City, that's George Brett. But it's going to be number three, George Orta, coming out. And so it will be Orta batting in place of Jim Sunberg. Orta, a 283 hitter on the year. He has hit eight home runs and driven in 44. And he will be batting for Sunberg. The only score in the game came back in the fourth inning when Doug DeSensei hit a home run. That's been it so far. Kansas City has runners at first and second. Well, Bo Jackson and his Kansas City Royal teammates conclude their series with the Angels tomorrow night. And then it's Chicago, Cleveland, and then the Texas Rangers all visiting right here at the Big A during that crucial final homestand. So don't forget to do your ticket shopping for those games coming up. First pitch is a curveball over for a strike. Also, we'd like to remind you that the Indians play a twilight doubleheader Monday starting at 535 right here at the Big A. That's to make up for that rainout game on this recent road trip in Cleveland. Here's the 0-1 pitch on the way. And it's a curveball hit between first and second. Polidor up with it, and he goes to Gritch in time. And so the defense plays well against Sutton here in the inning. As Polidor comes up with a big play. And for Kansas City, no runs and a base hit. They leave two. They've stranded five. And after six and a half, it remains. Angels on top, one nothing. All the other games going on, the White Sox leading Seattle 2 to nothing. They're in the top of the seventh, and in the National League, it's San Francisco leading San Diego 4-2. to two. They're in the bottom of the seventh. The Mets, of course, have clinched the National East. Finally, at long last, they were supposed to do it Friday, but uh, better late than never by beating the Cubs 4-2. to two. This division title is the third in Mets history. You'll remember back in that historic year of 1969, the amazing Mets in what may be the most amazing upset of all time in baseball. Won the National League East, beat the Braves in the playoffs, finished off the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series, and that after a disastrous year in 1968. What a turnaround. In 1973, the Mets won the National East with an 82-79 and record. That is the worst first-place finish in the history of divisional play. They defeated the Cincinnati Reds for the National League pennant and then lost the World Series to the Oakland A's, a hard-fought series, went the full seven games. New York entered the league as an expansion club back some 24 years ago in 1962, and that year they compiled a very uh, unenviable record, 40 wins, 120 losses. The worst mark, the worst in modern Major League history. The amazing Mets. Remember Marv Throneberry. Let's get back. Defensive change for the Kansas City Royals. Now behind the plate, Terry Bell will be doing the catching. He takes over for Sunberg. As we look around the infield and the outfield, no changes there as Danny Jackson goes back for another inning of work. He'll be facing Gus Powder, followed by Bob Boone and then Gary Pettis. Angels lead it by a score of one to nothing. As we mentioned to you, the Texas Rangers won this afternoon up in the Bay Area. In fact, they sweep that series against Oakland. They won on a shutout four to nothing over Oakland. Correa and Williams combined for the shutout. Baltimore defeated the Yankees. Mattingly extended his hitting streak to hitting streak to 17 games with Baltimore winning it. Sheets and Dempsey with home runs. And the first pitch to Polidor is outside for ball one. Baltimore snapping a five-game losing streak. Boston 4-1 over Milwaukee. It was the Cleveland Indians 5-2 over the Minnesota Twins. Detroit 8-6 over Toronto. Next pitch. Misses for ball two. And one other game in the American League still going on. Chicago at Seattle. No score after six innings of play. In the National League in the first of two games. Montreal 6-5 over Pittsburgh. Polidor takes one right around the letters for a snipe. And then Pittsburgh came back and won the nightcap 4-1. They split that double header. Houston, 6-1 over Cincinnati. It was New York, 4-2 over Chicago. The Mets clinch the National League East. 
Here's the 2-1 pitch by the left-hander. It is hit high in the air and struck well into right center field over and waiting for it. Here's Wilson, and he makes the catch, and there's out number one. behind Dwight Gooden? <laughs> <laughs> no. He has beaten the Cubbies eight straight times. I know that. There's one over for Bob Boone. The count is 0-1. Let's round out the scoreboard very quickly for you. St. Louis, 8-5 to over Philadelphia. Atlanta, 4-1 to over the Dodgers. They lose their fifth straight. And then in San Diego, it is San Francisco, 4-2 to two over the Padres. That's after 7.5. Gladden and Gwynn have hit home runs. There's a bouncer back up over the mound. Backhanded by White, who goes to first base in time. And what a play by the second baseman, Frank White. An outstanding play just to nab Boone by about a half a stride. A chopper back up over the mound in which White had to backhand and then jump in the air, spun and then do accurately to Kevin Seinzer at first base. And he didn't just get anybody. No. He got a man who scored from second base on, on a, a sacrifice, sacrifice fly. fly. That's right. Flash Boone. So two men are gone, and that brings up Gary Pettis. You know, I forgot to ask Booney about that on the pregame. There's a curveball high for ball one. He took a lot of ribbing, needless to say. Well, I should have given him a chance. How often do you score from second base on a fly ball to the outfield? 1-0 pitch. is fouled back out of play, and the count is now 1-1 to Gary. I bet that's the first time in his career. I would bet. I would venture to bet. I don't like to gamble too much. Pettis on the evening, one for three. He is hit in ten of the last twelve games. Here's the one-one pitch. And Pettis bounces one towards shortstop. Bianca Lana goes to the first baseman, Seitzer, and that'll do it for the Angels. A one, two, three, and he has seven in a row, by the way. Set down by Danny Jackson. Make that, yeah, that's correct. That is seven in a row. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left on base. Angels have stranded six, and after seven complete innings of play, Angels won. Kansas City nothing. Lots of good college football matchups coming up this weekend, this Saturday, and uh, one of the uh, more interesting ones, Alabama and Florida. Alabama number four on both the UPI and AP uh, polls. Florida number uh, 13 on the AP poll, not on the UPI poll, not because Florida doesn't have a good team, but because the UPI rules with the Board of Coaches voting, uh, say that no team under probation can appear in the UPI rankings. Uh, but Florida, you know, would be uh, somewhere in there, 12, 13, 14. Florida coach Galen Hall's main priority for his uh, game against number four Alabama Saturday is, uh, he says, giving standout quarterback Kerwin Bell some time to throw. You may remember that Bell was sacked six times in Florida's loss to Miami two weeks ago. 23 to 15 was that score. Hall says we're looking at several things to get Kerwin some more time. We've tried some quick passes this week in practice so he doesn't have to take a long drop. And we've worked some on the shotgun formation. We've got to be able to get the ball downfield and keep Kerwin off the ground. Coach Hall says the Gators used their uh, week off to put the Miami loss behind them, concentrate on preparing for Alabama this weekend, Florida's first Southeastern Conference opponent of the season. Hall says it was tough to lose to Miami, especially at home, but that game is behind us now. We've still got a tough schedule ahead of us. And, of course, the first game on that very tough schedule is this week against Alabama. We go to the eighth inning, and batting for Buddy Biancolana will be Hal McRae. And he'll be facing Don Sutton, who right now is leading by a score of one to nothing. And to tell you more about that, here's Al Cotton. All right, Ron, the Angels indeed enjoying that one nothing lead. Sutton going to work against McRae. Al McRae stepping in, hitting 260 with six home runs and 36 runs batted in. So he's up there in place of Biancolana. Sutton working on a two-hitter. He's already posted one two-hitter this year. That was against the White Sox at Comiskey Park when he threw his 58th career shutout as well. There's a fastball that misses 1-0. In fact, if Sutton throws a shutout tonight, and that's still a possibility, he would move past Ed Walsh into ninth place all by himself on the all-time list of pitchers who have thrown shutouts in this game. There's one fouled away by McCray, 1-1. Of course, the big leader, Walter Johnson, the big train, 113. Still seems incredible. Grover Cleveland Alexander, second with 90. 
Christy Matthews in third with 83. Cy Young only had 77. <laughs> then we talk about all those records and the things that would have a rough time breaking. That might be one right there, 113 career shutouts. Boy, that does seem unassailable. There's a pitch in there for a strike, one and two to McCray. Well, you know, then you got Eddie Plank at 70, Warren Spahn with 63, along with Mordecai Brown, Tom Seaver at 61, and then Sutton at 58. The one-two pitch is fouled back through the screen, and it's one and two. I mean, you have guys like Tom Seaver and Sutton and, and Carlton and Nolan Ryan and guys like that. If they can only seem to have 55 or 60 somewhere in that category, what do you, kind of a pitcher are you to have 113? You're in a higher league. you're Walter Johnson. Yeah, you're Walter Johnson. That's who you are. One ball, two strikes. The count to McCray. <clears throat> Sutton to the windup and the pitch. And his curveball misses low. Two and two. Well, it's been quite a night for none. The only base hits. Law with a single in the fourth. Quirk with a single in the se in the seventh. So just a two-hitter. That's all. Sutton at 41, making it look easy. The 2-2 pitch to McCray is a high drive to deep left field. Downing looking up, but this ball is gone. Hal McCray with a pinch hit home run, and we're tied 1-1 here in the A. So I think we might have jinxed on talking about the shutout and the two-hitter, and it all changes on one swing. So we're locked up in a tie. Willie Wilson will step in, and before he does, let's pause for station identification. This is the Angels Radio Network. This is the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. So Don Sutton gives up a home run to McCray, and he's going to come out of the ballgame. Marcel Atzman has gone to the mound, and Sutton, who was working on a shutout, pitches seven very strong innings, and in the eighth, he makes a mistake, and he'll leave. He'll leave throwing a three-hitter, giving up just one run. He obviously has reached the magic plateau of pitches. Ron's checking on that now. And he will give way to Doug Corbett. The right-hander Doug Corbett coming on. He'll take over for Sutton. Angels baseball coming to you from Anaheim Stadium with the score now. Angels won, and the Royals won. Well, they're still dancing in the streets in New York. By the way, uh, Marty Bondaroff on his motor scooter heading up Hollywood Boulevard now and enjoying himself. He's the Duke of uh, Hollywood Boulevard and Vine. Yes, he is. He was a little uh, timid when he came from the jungles of the Mideast, somewhere or another. But once he got uh, used to things around in Hollywood, he is uh, called Hollywood Marty now. Anyway, uh, I'll be sitting in the rest of the way, and perhaps we'll have an extra inning ball game. Thousands of people at Shea Stadium uh, swarmed into the field after the New York Mets clinched the National League East Division title on Wednesday with a 4-2 victory over the Chicago Cubs, and their celebration caused a lot of damage. Chunks of turf were torn out of the infield and thrown into the stands, and there was other scars, or other scars from the celebration in the outfield grass. During the game, taped video messages were shown to the fans as General Manager Frank Cashin Manager Davy Johnson and broadcaster Bob Murphy pleaded for an orderly uh, celebration. Nevertheless, fans started pouring into the field, even before second baseman Wally Backman fielded the game's last grounder. Fans celebrated on the field for about 20 minutes after the game ended. 50 minutes after it ended, the grounds crew was at work trying to get the field ready for Thursday afternoon's game. So they're still celebrating, and the Mets have finally uh, clinched it. Everybody knew that ever since the All-Star break, even before that, that they would eventually do just that. But taking over now for Don Sutton, who pitches a gem. Seven innings plus one batter. He throws three-hit baseball, but he leaves tied 1-1. And here's Willie Wilson against Corbett, and the first one is outside 1-0. You come to the ballpark as a pitcher and allow just three hits in a run, and you figure to win. But Danny Jackson has been equally tough, and so Sutton will not figure tonight. 
Corbett delivers to Wilson, and he's outside with it. So the count goes to 2-0. and oh. A 1-1 tie here in the eighth. Sutton making his second bid for win number 15, and he pitched well enough to get it, but apparently it wasn't to be. Wilson pulls one foul, pass first and down the line. So the count 2-1 and one to him. He's 0 for 3 tonight. We've told you that Sutton basically works on a 100-pitch limit. And tonight, in seven innings plus one batter, he pitches outstanding baseball and throws exactly 100 pitches. And so they lift him with the ball game tight. The 2-1 to, to Smith is Luke Fowle off the third and out of play. 2-2. Two two. Did I say Smith? It's Willie Wilson. Smith on deck. So Doug Corbett is out there now trying to get himself squared away. Overall, his numbers look pretty good. He's 3-2, and two, an ERA of 3.78 with nine saves. But most of his success was early in the year. The 2-2 pitch is swung on a miss, strike three, and he gets Willie Wilson. Corbett, though, in his last six outings, has struggled mightily. In fact, in five of those six, he's given up home runs. Last time, out against Cleveland, in Cleveland, he didn't get anybody out facing two batters, and they both got hits. But he comes on and he gets Willie Wilson to lead things off for him with a run already in in the eighth. Now it's Lonnie Smith and the first pitch is all the way to the backstop. 1-0. Oh. The 1-0 oh, and Smith lays down a bunt. It's a dandy up the third base line. The sensei has to let it roll, and then as it crosses the chalk, he touches it to make sure it stays foul. But if that one stays fair, Lonnie Smith is on with no problem. It was a beautiful bunt. One ball, one strike to Lonnie as he comes back. One tie here in the eighth. Home runs are figured for both teams. For the Angels, it was DeSensei back in the fourth. And for the Royals, it's McCray in a pinch hit roll here in the eighth. As Lonnie Smith fouls one off. So one and two. It has been a beautiful pitching duel to watch because both Sutton and Jackson outstanding. Corbett now trying to pick up the standard. One and two. He has Lonnie Smith waiting. The next pitch is low and inside, two and two. A run, six hits, and an error for the Angels. One run, three hits, and no errors for the Royals. Doug Corbett towing the rubber on the third base side. Now he straightens up. His two-two to Smith is down low, ball three. So he had him one and two, and now the count's full. The Sensei behind the bag near the line at third. Schofield in a step or two at short. Lonnie Smith can run well. The 3-2 pitch is chopped wide of third. The Sensei cuts the ball off in front of Schofield. Goes on to Gritch for the out. Two down. And that'll bring up Rudy Law. Who's one for three. When this series began, the Royals were playing their best baseball of the year. They had won six out of seven until last night's defeat. But that was at home. Now they're trying to pick up that kind of a pace on the road, and all year long they have struggled away from Kansas City. In fact, it has been a nightmare for them away from home. The pitch to Rudy is a little inside, 1-0. They're 26 and 43 overall away from Royal Stadium. And remember, this is the defending world champs. The 1-0 pitch is over for a strike called, 1-1. One and one. So it's not been a typical Kansas City year. They started slow, and they have not gotten that second-half kick that they usually are able to count on. The 1-1 from Corbett is pulled over first down the right field line and rolling into the corner. George Hendrick out to dig it out of the corner, and Rudy Law goes into second with a double. So a two-out. Two base hit by Rudy Law, and the Royals suddenly 
have the go-ahead run in scoring position. And that'll bring up Jamie Quirk, who is one for three. Quirk, while he's hitting around 220, over the last seven games, has hit close to 400. And that's why you have to be careful with him. So a meeting at the mound, Boone out to talk with Corbett. And now he comes back to the home plate area. Quirk up there with a chance to give his club the lead for the first time tonight. Until this inning began, the Angels were on top, but Hal McCray changed that with a pinch hit home run. Quirk settling in, Corbett checks second in the pitch. There's a fastball outside, 1-0. Angels one, Royals one. We're in the eighth. Corbett in some trouble now with two gone. Rudy Law stepping off at second base. Schofield hawking him a little bit. The outfield playing quirk to pull. And the 1-0 delivery is down low. Make it 2-0. It doesn't get any easier for Corbett if he loses quirk because Frank White's on deck. And of those in the lineup tonight for the Royals, he has the most home runs. Now they're going to take the bat out of Quirk's hand and with first base open and him being left-handed, they're going to walk him intentionally. So there's ball three and ball four follows. So they're going to play the percentages. And even though White has the more ominous set of numbers, the fact that he's right-handed leads the Angels to go after him rather than Quirk. So this is a big crossroads in the ballgame right now. Corbett has two outs, but he has two on behind him. And he's facing the Royals' toughest hitter for power and runs batted in. And the pitch, ground ball hit towards short. Schofield has it. He goes the short way to Polidor for the fourth, and the strategy works. So they walk quirk, they get the white, and they get the fourth to end the inning. Still, Kansas City gets even one run on two hits. The home run by McCray, the big one. There were no errors. Two men left aboard. And after seven and a half at the Big A, it's now Angels 1 and Kansas City 1. Well, all dressed up with no place to go. That applies to ABC, which finds itself with a Sunday baseball game of the week right down the stretch of the major leagues, but without a pennant race in which to focus. When ABC first got into baseball, it was strictly a Monday night affair so that the network could get a slice of the postseason pie. ABC was willing to sacrifice poor summer ratings for a crack at the uh, baseball world, but uh, either the League Championship Series or maybe the big advertising rating Grand Slam the World Series. The situation was modified when baseball allowed ABC to telecast a few late September Sunday games. ABC executives believed that even going up against the mighty National Football League on CBS and ABC, the network could fare no worse with a game between contenders it was doing on the generally low-rated Monday night baseball games. Well, the plan had worked well. ABC telecast the final game of the 1982 season. Baltimore and Milwaukee with Don Sutton and Jim Palmer vying for the American League East crown. The network also had some exciting contests last year when the eventual National League champion St. Louis Cardinals and New York Mets were dueling down to the wire. But this year's a different story. The Mets already always a lucrative draw because of the large New York market ended the National League East race seemingly before Memorial Day, and of course, on Wednesday, clinched it. Scratch the National League East from the potential Sunday ABC telecast. The National League West seems to be preferring a race between Houston and Cincinnati. Exactly your well, the Angels in another tight ball game. It's been night after night. Like like they are involved, involved in a scrape. And yeah, they're going to have to try and come up with the magic again. Here in the eighth inning, Dick Schofield will step in. He's two for three as Jackson goes to work. Downing and Desensei will be coming up next. And the next pitch is just inside the Schofield 1-0. The Angels on a roll. There's no question about it. They've had so many things go their way. And they just want to keep it moving in the right direction. Schofield grounds one back to the middle into center field. He has his third hit of the night. And the Angels have the potential go-ahead run on base. Now we'll see what Gene Mock chooses to do with Downing. Would he have him sacrifice? Brian doesn't do that very often, but every once in a while he might. In fact, checking Downing statistics this year, he has one sacrifice on the season. Just one. But you know, Gene likes little ball, and with the ball game up for grabs, we'll see if he asked Downing to come through with another. 
sacrifice punt. New shortstop for the Royals, Greg Pryor, taking over for Bianca Lana, who was lifted for the pinch hitter, McCray, who tied the game with a homer. So make the change in your scorebook. Jackson, meanwhile, will go to first base. Schofield is back. Dick with those 22 thefts to match the number on his jersey. Running, and he fouls it up the first baseline. 0-1. Oh well, Ron, Brian doesn't get a chance to bunt very often. But it appears that this will be one of those rare times. At least they had him trying on the first day. You know, it's not that manager Gene Mock does not think that Downing can get a base hit off of Danny Jackson. It's just that he thinks that Doug DeSensei can. And you give DeSensei a chance and Hendrick after that. If you can move Schofield up, throw to first base. And Dick is back again. Work in on the grass at third by several strides. And he's got in the line. The way Downing hits the ball, that's a dangerous position to be in if he doesn't bunt. Jackson ready, the strike one, and Bryan's around to bunt again, lays it down. First base side. Down to get it is Seitzer, and his only play is the white covering in time. And the sacrifice is executed perfectly. So the fans here at the Big A, knowing that Downing doesn't do that often, applauding the effort here. So Gene Mock getting the right kind of out from Downing, and now the question is, can they make it pay off? Schofield's in position. A 1-1 tie here in the eighth, and Doug DeSensei, who has carried the attack so many times the second half of the year, is going to be stepping in. Before he does, though, Mike Ferraro's going to the mound, and he's going to lift Danny Jackson. So the young left-hander, who has pitched very well, much as Don Sutton did, is going to leave it to the bullpen to try and keep the Angels from scoring in this inning. And we're waiting now for the bullpen gate to swing open and see who comes out. We would suspect Farr, Steve Farr, and that appears who it's going to be. So he's going to take over for Jackson Angels Baseball coming to you from the Big A with the score. Angels won. Royals won. Well, getting back to that situation ABC has with uh, the teams that have already sewed things up, just about sewed it up. The Mets did it on Wednesday, and the others are right behind. Well, right-hander Steve Farr loosens up on the mound. We can keep you informed as to all the prizes that are building for Fan Appreciation Day on September 28th. A bowling ball and bag from Brunswick will be among those given away. Sunday, champagne brunch at the Summer Tree Restaurant at the Emerald of Anaheim. break in the action. Let's look at some final scores in the National League. Montreal beat Pittsburgh 6-5 to five. in the first of a doubleheader. Pittsburgh even things up in the second game, winning 4-1. to one. In single action, Houston defeated Cincinnati by a score of 6-1. to one. And it was the Cardinals over the Phillies, 8-5. to five. Well, the battle lines have been drawn. Steve Barr summoned from the bullpen to try and put out the fire here in the eighth inning. A 1-1 tie to Sensei steps in trying to change it. Far ready at the bout and the pitch. And DeSensei takes a breaking ball in there for a strike, 1-1. One, one. With Dan Quisenberry having an off year, Steve Farr has filled much of the void for the Royals this year as he has pitched very well in a short relief role for them this season. He's 8-4, an ERA of 2.74. The pitch to Doug over again, strike two. And Doug backs away and takes a walk around home plate. Farr also with eight saves. And he has some impressive numbers because in 108 innings so far this year, he's given up just 86 hits. That's a very good ratio. He's had good control, too. He's walked only 36 men during that 108 innings, and he struck out 82. Well, he's been tough on just about everybody. He has to say no balls, two strikes. The pitch is a fastball high, one and two. Far a year ago... Split his time between the Royal AAA affiliate at Omaha and the Royals. But this year, he's become a major cog in their short bullpen. The Sensei waiting one and two. The Angels trying to regain the lead here in the eighth. Schofield at second with one out. 
Lots of room in right center for DeSinsa. And the one-two pitch is a fastball just inside. Doug was moving away from the pitch, but it wasn't that far off the plate. Two and two to count. The sensei planting the back foot now steps in. The crowd trying to help out in the background. Schofield being hawked by White and the pitch. Check swing. Did he go around? They appealed to first. No, he did not. Three and two to Doug. On deck, George Hendricks. deep and near the line at third. Meyer a step or two toward the hole at short, and out to the Rudy Law and left is deep and near the corner. The 3-2 to the Sensei is a ground ball to third. Down to get it is Quirk. The overhands to sights are in time, and the Sensei retires. And all the while, Schofield has to hold his second. So Jamie Quirk went down on one D to make sure that ball didn't get through him. And the play, 5-3. to three. So two down, George Hendricks due up, but he will not bat now that a right-hander has entered the game. Instead, Gene Mock goes to his bench, and Rupert Jones will be sent into the breach. Hendrick was one for three while he was in there, and now it's Rupert Jones' turn. Swing in the weighted bat, now putting some pine tar on the handle, and he will come walking up to the home plate area. Rupert hitting just 230, but he has 16 home runs, 46 runs batted in. The Angels have had many heroes the last month or so, and tonight may be Rupert's turn. A 1 1 tie here in the bottom of the eighth. Two outs, Schofield at second, eager to come home, and Rupert Jones will be stepping in. And as he does with first base open, Terry Bell, the catcher, will <laughs> put up the free pass sign, and they'll take the bat out of Rupert's hands and ask Bobby Gritch to step in there. And Bobby looking into the dugout as if to say... Skip, am I going to bat? Or are you going to send up another pinch hitter? So ball three has been issued. Ball four will follow. So Mike Ferraro, the manager, acting manager for the Royals, is playing his cards. He's going to make Gene Mock make a move. And stepping out of the Angel dugout to take over for Grinch is Wally Joyner. And now, just as an added note for you, Angels have been involved in five of the last six games have been one-run games. The Angels have won four of those, and the other one was a two-run ball game. So the Angels continue to play well in those one-run contests. And their overall record is what? 27 and 13, 27 and 12? 27 and 12, and that's a very impressive mark indeed. Now the joiner has been announced to the crowd. Out top Ferraro from the Royals dugout, and he's going to the mound, and that suggests he's making a change and that he'll bring in a left-hander to face Wally. And that's what's going to happen. So the chant is going up, Wally, Wally, but they'll have to wait to see what Joyner can do as Ferraro is going to play another card in his deck. It's a 1-1 tie, bottom of the A, and the ball game may well be on the line and Ferraro is pulling out the stops as a result. Black, who we referred to earlier in our broadcast, having on this date in 84 served up Reggie's 500th career home run. Black coming on now, not as a starter as he was then, but as a reliever. So he takes over Angels baseball coming to you from the Big A with the score. Angels won and the Royals won. Again, going over that uh, game at, uh, between the New York Mets at home at Chase Stadium, and they're clinching the East Division title of the National League against the Cubs. They certified what others had long ago conceded, that they would do that uh, long before the season's over. Dwight Gooden uh, pitched a six-hitter. Dave Madigan went three for four, giving the Mets 95 victories. 
more than the second-place Phillies could achieve even by winning the rest of their games. With a crowd of 47,823 cheering under a full moon, Gooden raised his record to 15-6. and six. Dennis Eckersley, now 6-10, and 10, took the loss as the Mets finally wrapped up a title they could have formulized five days ago. Magadan, a late replacement for virus-ridden first baseman Keith Hernandez, produced his first Major League RBI with third and fifth inning singles. Gooden lacked his best stuff, but struck out seven and walked four in his 11th complete game of the season. So left-hander Bud Black has entered this evening's drama. And as he does, he has some pretty good numbers, too, though he's 5-7, and seven, his earned run average 3.35. He's making his 51st appearance. And his 47th as a reliever. He has seven saves, so he and Favre combined for 15. In 105 innings, he's given up 89 hits. That's a good ratio right there. And he's walked 36 while striking out 61. So Bud Black loosening up. The Angels with two on, two out here in the eighth. And Wally Joyner due up the pinch hit for Gritch. Ten more games on this final homestand, and you can still order your tickets for... that have gone on in this inning. Barr was brought on. He got to Sensei. Hendrick was lifted for a pinch hitter, Rupert Jones. Rich is lifted for a pinch hitter, Wally Joyner. Barr gives way to Black, and so what has happened is that Mike Ferraro has brought in a right-hander, and in the process, he has gotten rid of a couple of right-handed hitters in the Angel attack, Hendrick and Gritch. And now he has another left-hander on the mound. And it's lefty against lefty. And at least percentage-wise, it would appear Kansas City with the edge. But that's assuming that Black is facing the average left-hand hitter. Joyner has been anything but that all year. He's hitting 296 as he steps in. Two on, two out. A 1-1 one, one tie in the eighth. And Black delivers a fastball that's low. 1-0. So part of the fun of this time of the year is watching the virtual chess game between the managers as they try to orchestrate their pieces to best advantage. The so 1-0, and Joyner takes in there for a strike, and he was bending away from that one. One and one. One run, seven hits, and an error for the Angels. One run, four hits, and no errors for the Royals. Black, fastball, slider pitcher, and he has emerged as a good one out of the pen. He takes a glance at the runners. The 1-1 one, one to Joyner. Side armor grounded toward the right side. Backhanded by White. He overhands to Seitzer in time, and the inning is over. Ferraro apparently makes all the right moves as the manager for the Royals and the Angels are denied. No run. One hit, no errors. Two men left on base, and we're going to the ninth, locked up in a 1-1 one, one tie. In the National League at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, that game is, again, that final score in the American League. The Pale Hose 3 and the Seattle Mariners nothing. As we go to the ninth inning, a 1-1 tie. Let's pause for station identification. This is the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Doug Corbett concluding his warm-ups as we go to the ninth inning. The 6, 7, and 8 man will be coming up for the Royals, and that means Seitzer, Bo Jackson, and Terry Bell, assuming no substitutions for manager Mike Ferraro. And Seitzer will indeed come up to start things. The two starting pitchers gone now. Sutton and Jackson both pitched well. Sutton going seven innings, giving up three hits and a run. And the run came in on the home run by McCray. Jackson went seven and a third, gave up seven hits in one run, and that came on a home run by DeSensei. So we have another tight ball game, and the Angels certainly have been in their share lately. Seitzer 0 for 2 with a walk. Corbett ready to go, and the first pitch is swung on a top foul at the plate on one. In the key games elsewhere in baseball tonight, Boston took a giant step 
record winning that American League East Division Championship. They beat Milwaukee 4-1 to one behind Oil Ken Boyd, while both Toronto and New York were losing. The strike one, and that's over but low. One and one to Seitzer. So that means Boston has its magic number reduced to seven. And they have a big ten-game lead in the East. There's a fastball outside to Seitzer, two and one. Speaking of the divisional leaders, in the National League East, New York won their ball game over Chicago behind Dwight Gooden, and they clinched the Eastern Division Championship there. So congratulations to the Mets. The next one to Seitzer is popped into the air, shallow left center field, Pettis and Downing converging, and it's Pettis to make the catch. And that'll bring up Bo Jackson. The Angels defensively here in the ninth, a couple of changes. Wally Joyner, who pinch hit for Bobby Gritch in the eighth inning, staying in there at first base. And Rupert Jones, who did much the same for George Hendrick, now in right field for him. Here's Bo Jackson, who in a similar situation last night hit a home run to the opposite field to momentarily give the Royals a tie. And the Angels subsequently won it in the bottom of the eighth. And here's Jackson, who's already earned the respect of the opposition after a very brief stay in the big league. Corbett ready, and now he'll deliver. And the first pitch to Bo Jackson is a fastball low, 1-0. And while Jackson is a threat for the long ball, certainly, he is a threat also for the base hit, even an infield base hit. And the Angels have the left side of the infield shortened up on him. The next pitch is swung on a miss, and he was trying for the home run right there. He was thinking downtown. Big cut, big miss, one ball, one strike to him. The Angels with the infield in on the left side, and you can understand the thinking of Gene Mark if Jackson chops one on the ground. With his feet, he's going to beat it out unless you play in a little bit. He already has five infield hits. A point well taken. Here's the 1-1 one -one to Jackson, and it's just inside. Good one. So while the left side is in, the right side is a normal depth. Maybe even a little back as far as Joyner's concerned. He's almost on the rim at first. So an interesting alignment, and I would guess that that would be the reason. Ron, would you think of any other that would make sense? The Angels, in essence, showing respect for his speed as well as his power. The 2-1 from Corbett. Chopper toward short. Cut off by DeSensei. He throws the first in time. Well, the Angels had Jackson pick it out there. And the defense perfectly set up for him. So two down, and that'll bring up Terry Bell, a young catcher up from the minor league. Bell, acquired by the Mariners in exchange for pitcher Mike Kuzman back in May, hit 235. Down in the minors this year at the double-A level with no home runs, 15 RBIs. The first one from Corbett, swung on a miss, on one A 1-1 one -one tie, we're in the ninth. Two out, nobody on. Terry Bell at the plate. He does not have a big league hit yet. The pitch to him is over for a strike, on two. Bell, in fact, getting his first chance at a big league at bat. He walked once in a previous plate appearance, but that's it. The 0-2, the ground ball to short, Schofield to his right, gloves it, sidearm to Joyner in time, and the ninth inning is in the book. Doug Corbett has pitched well in relief for two innings, and that may be a good, be a good sign for the future. So, the Royals gone in order in the ninth, will go to the bottom of the ninth, Burleson, Polidor, and Boone are due up with the score. Angels won, Royals won. Stall Digers ace Fernando Valenzuela's bid to become the National League's first 20-game winner. Bottom of the ninth inning here at Anaheim Stadium. The Angels and the Royals locked up in a 1-1 tie. And the Halos, who have come up with so much magic of late in the late innings, has to do it again. But Black, though... Trying to send it into extra innings. He has concluded his warm-ups. The throw has gone down to second base, and we're just about ready for this ninth inning to unfold. This crowd of some 27,067 not going anywhere, not with the way the Angels have been playing lately. And they're hopeful that tonight again they'll be able to go home celebrating a late-inning rally for the Angels. Rick Brulson trying to do the honors to start it here. He is 0 for 2 tonight. 
Quirk inside the bag near the line at third. Black delivers a fastball that's tied away, 1-0. Oh. Seitzer at first base. Behind the bag, he's near the line there, too, as they protect against the extra base hit. The 1-0 pitch, and that's a change over nicely, 1-1 one one to Burley. Checking the outfield alignment. They are swung around slightly toward right for Burleson. Fairly good-sized hole to shoot out in the alley and left. The 1-1 one one to Burleson is swung on, popped in the air in the shallow left center field. Willie Wilson coming on. Lonnie Smith is there, too, and it's... Lonnie Smith, correction, Rudy Law makes the catch. Lonnie Smith, assuming a DH role tonight, and it's Law and left. Second baseman, Gus Polidor. So one away, and Gus Polidor steps in. He is 0 for 3. He had two hits last night. In fact, he's had a couple of two-hit performances since his recall. So he has not been an easy out, although he's hitless this evening. Bell wigwagging the sign. Black into his wind. The first one to Polidor is a fastball outside, 1-0. Oh. The Angels have played a lot of extra inning games lately. Remember, on the road trip, they played one in Cleveland and two in Chicago. Here's the 1-0 pitch to Black. And it swung on and fouled back, 1-1. One and, one. and the Angels would like to win at regulation here. But unless they can get something going, extra innings would be in the offing. The Angels six and five in extra innings, and Kansas City six and nine. The one one to Polidor, change over again, make it one and two. The Angel magic number is ten. All the other divisional leaders in baseball tonight won and dropped theirs a notch or more, and the Angels would like to do the same. The one-two pitch to Polidor, and there's a broken bat ground ball slowly past the mound towards second. White has it and goes to first in time. There are two down, and Bud Black sprawled out on the ground <laughs> watching that play. He tried to flag down the little roller and then fell to the turf, but he appears to be okay. So two up, two down in the ninth inning, and Bob Boone will step up. is 0 for 3 tonight, but that's deceiving because he might well have had two hits. After hitting back to the box in the third, he lined to second in the fifth and then hit a big chopper over the mound behind second in the seventh inning. Frank White made a nice play on him. Black sends it home and a fastball is high. 1-0. Oh. Angels 1 and the Royals 1. Bottom of the ninth inning here at the stadium. The Sensei homer to get the Angels on the board in the fourth. McCray with a pinch hit blast in the A. Fastball is high to Boone, 2 0. So both teams have scored with the long ball. And the pitching really has been outstanding tonight. Black shaking off a couple of signs. Here's the 2 0 delivery to Boone. And it's high away, ball three. But you know the fact that the two teams have put on a pitching clinic tonight, that really isn't that surprising. Because entering this series, these two teams are the top two in terms of pitching in the American League. Kansas City with a staff ERA at 3.82. The Angels right behind at 3.88. Boone takes one in there for a strike. Make it 3-1. Although Kansas City would tell you, though, we're leading the league in ERA, it has not been a dominating type performance. They've had their problems. The 3-1 to Boone. Popped up, foul ground, first base side. Coming over for the ball is Seitzer, but he's going to run out of room as it goes back into the crowd about five rows. Three and two, the count to Booney. Tomorrow night in the finale of the series, Mike Witt, 17 and 8, goes against Dennis Leonard, 8 and 11. Why don't you come out and join us? It's been great baseball here at the stadium for about a month now sure you want to be part of it. The 3-2 to Boone is a drive into right field. Bo Jackson going back, but he's there, and he makes the catch, and the side retires. So the Angels go quietly against Bud Black in the ninth, and that means we're going to extra innings. And as we look at the scoreboard, the story quite simple. It's the Angels 1 and the Royals 1. Well, it's been quite a night for pitchers here at the Big A. Just about everyone who has towed the rubber has been outstanding tonight for both sides. 
And we're locked up in a 1-1 tie as we go to the 10th inning. Another extra inning ball game for the Angels, and they certainly have had a lot lately. And as we mentioned in the ninth inning, they had three on the last road trip alone, three of the six ball games. And they're going extra innings tonight. And to tell you how the Angels have done in extra innings and more, here's Ron. Thank you very much, Alan. Greg Pryor will lead things off. He'll be followed by Willie Wilson and then Lonnie Smith. In extra inning games, Angels have won six of 11, while Kansas City has won six of 15 this year. So the Angels with a slight edge as far as extra inning games are concerned. This will be the first plate appearance of the game for Greg Pryor. Doug Corbett back to the mound for another inning of work. And the first pitch is over the plate but low for ball one. One ball and no strikes. <laughs> one ball, no strikes. Pryor batting 171. No home runs and five runs driven in. Corbett working from the stretch. And the next pitch is a bouncer foul wide of third. A couple of hops and then goes into the stand. One ball, one strike. Angels with a run in the fourth inning and the home run by Doug DeSensei. And then a pinch hit home run by Hal McRae. In the eighth inning, that has tied it. Here's the 1-1 pitch by Corbett and it's in the dirt low for ball two. Two and one. John Sutton started, went seven innings. Really pitched a fine ball game. Whenever you can hold this Kansas City team to just one run for seven innings, you've done a good job. Sutton walked three, struck out three, and gave up just three hits. So a good performance by the veteran right-hander. Fire waiting. Here's a 2-1 pitch, and it's a comebacker in one easy hop. Corbett has it, and he goes to join her. There's out number one. And that will bring up the leadoff man, Willie Wilson. Willie Wilson. And Wilson is 0 for 4 tonight. He has struck out a couple of times. But it's hit safely in six of the last seven games. So this is a very important out right here. Wilson batting 270. About two or three years ago, he led the the American League in hitting. There's a bouncer to shortstop on two hops. Schofield with a quick release in time. And they get the speedster going down the line. That is six three and a put out. That makes two away. And that brings up the designated hitter, Lonnie Smith. Angels have out hit Kansas City seven to four. And we're tied at one. Lonnie Smith, 0 for 4. He is working on an 11-game hitting streak. Action out of the Angels' bullpen. Cannot see who it is right now. And the pitch by Corbett is a check swing, and it's fouled away. Lonnie Smith batting 290. Started the game at 293. That's the high point of the season for him there. the other games we have final scores for you Ray Chadwick throwing out of the bullpen for the Angels a right-hander the sensei on the line at third joining her just a little bit off the line at first base the 0-1 pitch is low and outside 101 outfield of Downing Pettis and then Rupert Jones Lonnie Smith pretty much straight away. Here's the 1-1 pitch by Corbett. Hit off the hands. Rolled towards shortstop. Coming in is Schofield. He has it. Scoops and throws in time. Another good play by the shortstop. And Doug Corbett has an easy 1-2-3 inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left on base. And after nine and a half here at the Big A, we're still tied at one. Take on the third defendant, Thomas Carbone, who is a fugitive and was tried in, abs- in Absentina. Half of the tenth inning. They're going to be sending up the top of the order. It'll be Gary Pettis, Schofield, and then Brian Downing. Game tied at one. Danny Jackson started. And went seven and one-third inning. And then Steve Farr came in and worked one-third of an inning, and now it has been Bud Black. Gary Pettis will be batting right-handed. He is one for four this evening. And as we had mentioned, Gary swinging the bat well lately. He has hit safely in 10 of the last 12 games. Here's the first pitch of the inning by the left-hander, and Pettis swings through a high fastball. May have chased ball one. So the count is 0-1 to Gary. Bud Black, 5-7 and seven against the league, making his 51st appearance of the year. He's worked in 104 innings at the start of the night. 
The next pitch is a breaking ball low and inside. That evens up the count. One ball, one strike. They shade Pettis way around toward right field. There's a huge gap in left center. If Gary can get out in front of one. Here's the one-one pitch on the way, and Pettis hits one off the hands. An easy comeback to Bud Black. He has it, and he goes on to first base, and there's out number one. One three and a put out. That brings up Dick Schofield. Schofield, he's had a good night. He has three hits in this game. He's three for four. Last year, Bud Black had a record of ten and fifteen. Appeared in thirty-three games. Used as a starter. Completed five, tossed a couple of shutouts last year, pitched in 205 innings. The left-hander, six foot two, 180 pounder, makes his home there in Kansas. And the first pitch here is on the outside corner, strike one to Schofield. Black builds to wind up again, and the left-hander's 0-1 pitch is high and outside. That evens up the count. Bud came to the major leagues in 1982, but it was in 83 where he still really started putting some victories together. Here's the 1-1 pitch. A changeup swung on and missed Schofield, really fooled on the pitch. And the count goes to 1-2. and two. It was in 83 that Black won 10 ball games while losing just 7. And then came back in 84, won 17 ball games, and then last year won 10. Schofield waiting, and the one-two pitch is on the way, and Schofield takes it high for ball two. Two balls and two strikes. Black can rush it up there in a hurry. He has pretty good stuff. His strikeout ratio this year. Here's the two-two pitch. He swung on, hit in the hole, and under the glove of Quirk, on into left field. And Schofield has four hits in the game. right now is checking to see how many times this year Schofield has had four hits in a game or if he has had one. That brings up Brian Downing. Downing is 0 for 2 tonight. He popped up to first, struck out, walked in the fifth and sacrificed in the eighth. And so we have just informed, thank you Al, this is the first four hit game for Schofield this year. So the Angels have the winning run on base. Black comes set, the high leg kick, runner does not go, and there's a tailing fastball outside for ball one. Well, would you send him on? Would you give him a shot, or would you just figure that Downing is a potentially an extra base hitter or a long ball man, and, and if he finds the alley, Schofield has a chance to score. What would you do? Well, Schofield has stolen 22 of 26 attempts. I'd have to say that if he can get a good jump, go ahead and let him go. But the one thing is you don't want to do is run out of the inning. There's a toss to first base. Black appears to be one of those left-handers that if he's not looking at you, you better be careful. There is an unknown quantity in all of this thinking, though. It's Barry Bell. Barry Bell, the catcher. You don't know, and that's one of the scouting reports that manager Gene Mock has to know. What kind of a throwing arm does Bell have? And we have never seen him throw. Black comes set, runner does not go, and the pitch is over for a strike. That evens up the count. In the last 11 games, Downing has been very consistent. He has driven in 11 runs. As we mentioned to you in the month of September, he's been batting right close to that 400 mark with three home runs to go along with that almost 400 batting average. There's a throw to first base, and that time Bud Black, like so many left-handers, stepped about three quarters. He did not step to the plate, but he didn't step to first base either. And that's a borderline balk. The left-hander comes set again, and Downing swings and fouls one back out of play, and boy, did he have a rip. You know, the outfield has fanned out well for Downing. There's lots of room in both alleys. There's a big, big hole between Law and Wilson. Really, Law deep and near the line, almost in the corner out there in left. That is true, and you've got all three guys out there that can run extremely well, Wilson in center, and, of course, Bo Jackson in right. So if you hit one between them, you better hit it hard and better not hit it very high. Black again ready, and the pitch to Downing is swung out, hit well to left field. Back goes Rudy Law, he's in the corner. Look out, it's gone! And the Angels win it, three to one. Brian Downing with his eighth 
Chase Hall run of the year wins it for the Angels in the bottom of the tenth inning. And Doug Corbett picks up the victory. And for the total, here's out. Well, another dramatic finish for the Angels. The crowd on his feet for the Halos. Three runs on nine hits. They commit one error and leave eight men on base. For the Royals, one run on just four hits. They commit no errors and leave seven men on base. The winning pitcher, as you've heard, is Doug Corbett. And Doug pushes his record to four and two. The loser is Bud Black. He falls to five and eight. All of this before 27,067 here in the house tonight. And they'll go home happy again.